Okay. At 6 o'clock, that means it's about time to go live with this. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is um, dystopia and utopia in literature, books, games, uh, all of those sorts of things, and what those two things actually represent and what they mean for the people who actually um, put them into their works. So just a quick bit of definitions. Um, utopia usually is an ideal society, a, a perfect society, not necessarily perfect, but an expression of an ideal fully brought out um, is the broadest definition I can give. And a dystopia is really the inverse of that. A dystopia is um, when you are showing a society that's completely uh, in the reverse of that, um, that a, a society that is really bad for the people that are in it. And uh, depending on its relationship with utopian ideals, dystopia can actually um, express the problems with uh, viewpoints of utopia. So before I get into those um, and this little lecture to open up our discussion, let me, uh, as a background, another background to this, let me talk about two uh, important ways that these ideas are expressed or two visions through which these ideas are expressed. Um, these are a set of competing visions that Thomas Sowell talked about in his um, his book, A Conflict of Visions, which is a, a very, very good book. I do recommend it. It's a great book on political philosophy. Um, Conflict of Visions basically sets out two competing uh, visions for humanity. One, which is what Tom Sowell called the unconstrained vision, and the other one, which is what Tom Sowell called the constrained vision. Um, the unconstrained vision views humanity as malleable, perfectible, um, changeable, and ultimately that ideals can be fully realized uh, in the real world with enough work or the right amount, uh, you know, the right people in charge. That's the, that's the unconstrained view. The constrained vision is a view of man as being a flawed and fixed creature, meaning um, his nature is fallen and sinful, and it can't really be corrected except through, um, you know, s s some union with God, let's say. Um, so essentially, here in the world that we live in, it's a fallen world. It's a world where we can't achieve perfection. It's a world where we personally can't achieve perfection. And it's a world where the best that we can hope to do is a prudent set of trade-offs. So the unconstrained vision would want to remake society into some perfect vision. And the constrained vision would want to fix whatever the most pressing and prudent problem is that has the least amount of downsides. The constrained vision is very obsessed with process costs. That is, um, what are the downsides to actually trying to change something about the world? And the unconstrained vision is not as concerned with process costs um, as it is with the final goal, like the arrival point. And so um, usually in most cases, the you can think of this competition between the ends and the means. Um, the unconstrained vision views the end as justifying the means, and the constrained vision doesn't see it that way. Um, the constrained vision thinks that the the proper means are the correct end. Um, and so when you have these two visions, these are expressed in different ways and the conflict between them is expressed in different ways with utopian literature. Um, a little bit on utopian literature. It takes its name from a book by uh, Sir Thomas More from, um, I want to say, I don't remember the date, the 16th century. It's written in Latin, um, but you can find a lot of uh, translations out there of utopia. And Utopia describes this society that is at that is some ideal presentation of what um, what Moore was imagining. But it itself is somewhat satirical and recognizes what might be considered the constrained vision. Um, it recognizes that these things are not really possible, and so you have to be more pragmatic. Uh, in it, there's like a communist type of society. Everybody's agrarian. Everyone switches homes every 10 years. The entire society is built around how you can have a communist society where people still have skin in the game. So, you know, if you have to change homes every 10 years, then you're not going to trash the home that you're in um, because you don't want the other person to trash their homes. So everybody acts in it in a pretty perfect way. Um, and that's really where we get the idea of utopian literature, but uh, the utopian idea can be expressed through lots of different pieces of literature 
going down throughout history. Um, you could look at, say, Plato's Republic um, as being somewhat utopian, but Plato himself was a little bit more constrained. That's why he envisioned these philosopher kings, because he viewed regular people as being um, imper you know, imperfectible. So um, Plato's solution was some small class of people could be perfectible, but even if the greatest part of humanity wasn't, as long as you had the correct government with the correct people running that government, then their perfectibility or near perfectibility would create a more idealized society. Um, in modern literature, there's a lot of different expressions of utopia and dystopia. Um, just to kind of round out the political discussion, Marxism is a unconstrained view and it's a utopian view. So what Marx really envisioned was you would have a socialist society, which is where the, the state owns the means of production. And that would actually wither away. Like through socialism, um, you would remake the human spirit. Essentially, man would be perfected into a communist man. And at that point, the state would no longer be needed. It would wither away and you'd end up with a, uh, a communist society, a classless, stateless society. Um, and what's interesting about Marxism is that it's a combination of these two kinds of visions. And Thomas Sowell actually talks about Marxism specifically in conflict divisions, that it's um, it's sort of a hybrid of these two. It starts off as a constrained vision. You know, you need a socialist government to actually enforce socialism. Uh, but through that, you would end up with um, a perfect society. You end up with a utopia. Um, and so through those definitions, it's also worth noting that there's never been a communist society. So when people talk about socialism and communism, and you're explicit about socialism, hey, the United Soviet Socialist Republics, the great communist empire of, uh, of the Soviet Union, uh, was a socialist dictatorship. It was a socialist government. And same thing with China is socialist, right? Uh, North Korea is socialist, and they use the word socialist explicitly because the communist, the ideal communist society hasn't evolved from that, if you're going from, from Marx's perspective. Of course, the Chinese and the North Koreans have their own version of socialism and communism and their own ideals with it. But um, that's the basic that's the basic premise here. Um, so it, it views the end result as being a utopia. Um, and it's really a good place to jump into this discussion because through this vision of an ending utopia of a classless, stateless society, you end up with a dystopia. You end up with horribly oppressive governments all of the worst governments, the most murdering governments of the 20th century um, were socialist, uh, maybe with the exception of um, the Ottoman Turks um, in respect to like the Armenian genocide. Uh, but, you know, the National Socialists, the Nazis were socialist. Um, the USSR was socialist. Uh, China and its, um, you know, its cultural revolution uh, and all that stuff, that was all socialist. Um, the Khmer Rouge was socialist, North Korea is socialist, Vietnam socialist. So um, the socialist governments of the 20th century produced some horrific dystopias for the people that um, were subject to those societies. But the goal was actually utopia. And so in that we can see this conflict. And we actually see this, this sort of duality reflected a lot in literature, particularly literature and movies um, and even games from the 20th century and early 21st century here, which express this. Um, so a really good one that I can think of is V for Vendetta, which was a, a graphic novel and, and then a movie, um, which had some very uh, anarchistic uh, views to it, but it portrayed a dystopia. And the dystopia was, of course, a realization of somebody's utopia. Uh, and of course, the solution to the dystopia was not to replace it with utopia, but to eliminate the dystopia and allow for freedom, which would be an imperfect but better uh, society. And so that's one of the themes that you see. Same thing with Star Wars. You have a dystopia in the Empire, and the Empire needs to be destroyed and replaced again with the with the Republic, um, which was imperfect, but um, was better, but allowed people to be free, um, allowed for human dignity, even though, you know, most of the people were aliens, right? Uh, and so you also see George Lucas express that with the prequel trilogies, that the, the Republic is very corrupt, it's fallen, it's imperfect. And so one of uh, Anakin's 
one of his main motivations is to remove this and replace it with something more perfect, um, something that's ordered uh, from the top down that will eliminate some of the problems of uh, of the republic. So a lot of these a lot of these conflicts you will find within um, within these things. So depending on who is writing it and what perspective they're trying to create with this contrast between utopia and dystopia you get an iteration of that so in 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 the case where you are from the constrained vision you're usually going to get an expression of utopia that is somebody's um it's actually dystopia and so it's somebody's attempt to create utopia but due to the fallen nature of man it creates dystopia here's another great example one is a game one is a very important book from the 20th century so atlas shrugged uh, by ayn rand if you haven't read it, it should probably be on your reading list. It's a little long, but it's it's good and it has a lot of interesting ideas to mull about. It was very influential on me as a young person. Um, although as I grew up, um, I began to be more rejecting of the unconstrained vision that uh, Atlas Shrugged had. Uh, Ayn Rand explicitly rejected the idea that man cannot be perfected and she talked about this in the virtue of selfishness that man is perfectible and needs to be perfectible for him to have um, her system of rational ethics so in atlas shrugged you have john galt and his utopian society of supermen and that's really a utopian ideal this is ideal where the smartest and the best are free to do what they want and it's contrasted with the outer world, the, the main world of the dystopian, um, altruistic uh, United States, where altruism is an ideal that's forced upon people, that they need to sacrifice what they have for the betterment of society. Um, and so that creates a dystopia. So the realization of the ideal of altruism creates a dystopia. And then um, the when the, the smartest and best people withdraw from that, that's them creating their utopia. Now, this is reflected um, by somebody who is, um, I shouldn't say somebody, but if you've ever played the game Bioshock, very good game. I do recommend it. If you haven't played it, I don't know. Uh, maybe you don't play games. Uh, there was three Bioshock games. Um, the first one is the one I'm thinking of, where you go to this undersea city, and um, it is a... When you come in, you're treated to some of the speeches that are from, you know, from John Galt and Alice Shrugged, kind of reminiscent of that. Uh, but what you see is something that's horrific. You see a horrific, hellish um, dystopia, not just a, not really a dystopia, but like a, a cataclysmic um, kind of terrible, terrible place. And that really expresses this view that's, you know, the ideals that are expressed in, um, in Rand's books are admirable, however trying to express them with fallen people results in dystopia. Uh, in other words, it's a constrained reflection upon Rand's work. Um, so you can look at lots of different works as as being different iterations of the same, um, this same conflict. One of the things that uh, really can make me kind of come out of a work is if it views utopia as possible. Uh, and it's pretty rare that you read something where utopia is explicitly possible. Um, it's more just that utopia is an ideal uh, or that the utopia creates something bad for most people. That it's utopia, but not really. Like Logan's Run, everybody's young and beautiful and healthy, but the computer kills you when you're 30. And that's the downside. So there's this really great pleasure-based society where nobody has to work. However, you only live to be 30 years old in it. So there's a significant, terrible trade-off for uh, experiencing the so-called utopia. Um, that's a great example of, of utopia versus dystopia. So the utopia is really a dystopia. Um, let, me, let me think about another um, couple of interesting ones while we go ahead and read the chat. Um, there's lots of different ways that you can find and, uh, and see these different versions of utopia and dystopia um one of the th things i'm reminded of is if you ever had to do talk about utopian literature in in your english classes let's say um i don't know anyone who's ever gotten the point of utopian literature which is the stuff that i'm talking about which is that we're really expressing our view of what we wish society would be like but it can't be that way because we know people are flawed 
um, and that and that big conflict between the constrained and unconstrained vision. You know, I've had friends. You had to do. Um, you know, we all had to do utopia projects at some point in an English class, like d design your ideal society. It's like, I think you're missing the point of what expressions of utopia are supposed to mean. Even uh, Thomas More uh, in the book Utopia, is it's somewhat satirical and he kind of admits that it's not really possible. It's just kind of an intellectual game and something fun for him to think up um, and not really something that he was serious about representing um, something that could be actually articulated and realized in the world. Um, so anyway, let's take a look at some of the chat. Um, again, if you want to get my attention, um, you got to put at David Stewart. That's how I'm going to know that you actually want to talk to me or do a super chat. That's how to get my immediate attention. Otherwise, I might just assume that you're talking to someone else in the chat and I'll skip over what you're saying. Um, let's see here. Have you ever read um, Hop? He basically piles socialists and communists together and views political ideology on a spectrum from voluntarism to completely authoritarian. I haven't read it, but you know, that, that to me, socialists and I, I do, there is, there's a continuum. Socialists and communists are really the same thing because of what I mentioned, socialism and communism. Um, communism is the end result of the, the more constrained socialism. Uh, what, what a lot of people think of sometimes here in, in the United States, and I'm guilty of this, is you think of you know certain Scandinavian countries as like socialist or being having some hybrid socialist system because they've socialized some service element in their um, in their society. So they socialize the their medicine, um, right? So the the area of the economy known as medicine has been taken over by the government. Um, it's either funded by the government or controlled entirely by the government. So they own the means of that production, and therefore it's a socialist society and it works. Not necessarily, because the funding for that occurs through capitalistic enterprise that's taxed and siphoned off to pay for it. So it's really just a, a robust welfare state and not a socialist society because people are still free to own their own means of production outside of medicine. And in a lot of cases, you have problems with those elements that have been socialized. Like Venezuela is a great example. You socialize or you nationalize. You see, they don't use socialize anymore. Uh, they use nationalize. You nationalize the uh, the oil industry, and then that sector of the economy collapses due to mismanagement, and it creates a terrible depression because that ends up being the you know that's the majority of the economic activity is oil exports. So when that collapses and there's ma uh, major problems from that, you no longer have the ability to fund whatever welfare programs you have, or just to provide general commerce for the rest of the economy it becomes a major problem. Um, so if you look at each individual part of that, you can judge whether or not, you know, you can socialize the roads within a town, like the roads are socialized. And usually that doesn't cause a big problem. Um, but other things that involve constant work uh, and not like an infrastructure investment tend to not be quite as quite as functional as as building roads or dams or things like that and even with building roads here in california we have major problems with it um anyway let's let's keep going on jared wiggle 1984 is a really good representation of dystopian society in both the book and the film so much so that we see many parallels in that work now absolutely 1984 is one of my favorite books and i recommend everybody read it it's a very well written book and it has really really great ideas in it um to mull about another one of those um Unlike Atlas Shrugged, it's really well written and it's a great story on its own that really makes you care about the characters and their struggles. What's interesting about 1984, 1984 is a fully dystopian realization of what the socialist countries um, in the 20th century were doing. Uh, and so that's one of the things that's great about 1984 is it's, it takes the reality of the socialist system and just takes it to the extreme and lets you see just how bad it can get when you fully commit to it. Um, something that completely dehumanizes people and to to a, a much more important end, you don't know if it's really 1984 because you don't know how long the party's been in power. It may have been in power hundreds of years. There's no end to the party controlling the system. This communist system doesn't emerge in other words. Um, Oh, uh, Cody Pennant, $5 super chat. Thank you. I appreciate that. New Zealand dollars. I hope those are valuable. <laughs> I appreciate it. How do you get through a message of moral and political or lack of, um, how do you get a message of moral and political ideals through to an audience in a novel without coming across didactic, um, and propagandistic? 
Um, that's a hard one. So I can tell you what works. Um, George Orwell's George Orwell's work pretty well, but they are, um, you know, they are explicit with their perspective. I think 1984, Animal Farm is maybe a, a more, I don't want to call it propaganda because that's really something that originates from the government, but it expresses its political perspective very acute, acutely. 1984 is more subtle. What you probably don't want to do is actually Atlas Shrugged because Atlas Shrugged, um, rather than having a good story, it it tends to it tends to sacrifice the story for the sake of soliloquy and expression of the ideals, and that makes the book much harder to read. Now the ideals might be more you know more clearly defined and expressed properly within Atlas Shrugged than in 1984 Animal Farm, but which one would you rather read? Well, I've read Atlas Shrugged. I've actually read it twice. I'm a weirdo. Um, I've read 1984 a bunch of times. Same thing with Animal Farm. And which one would I want to reread? It's probably 1984. It's a better piece of craft. So I think if if you just focus on telling a good story and the background of it is that moral and political conflict, even people who disagree with your conclusions or maybe don't want to see that particular kind of conflict expressed, they might just enjoy the story anyway. Um, you know, people may not like the idea that the Empire represents like socialism or something in Star Wars or or that you could take it that way, but they'd like the story anyway, even if they are like very pro-government, pro-big government. Um, so I don't know. I think that I think it's probably write a good story first and have the moral and political ideals as part of the conflict um, and avoid soliloquy. And it probably won't come across as propagandistic propaganda sometimes we use the word propaganda too maybe too loosely propaganda is really something that originates explicitly from government and, and political entities um, and it's explicitly for uh, changing people's minds um, in some cases just an expression of political ideals isn't propaganda uh, propaganda would be you know, when the U.S. government has a has a commercial that like, um, you know, vaping is just as bad as smoking, that's propaganda. Um, it actually is propaganda. That's it like meets the definition of it pretty 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 clearly. Um, but as far as just writing a good story, it's not really propaganda, in my opinion. Um, Bob says, why has dystopian fiction become associated with apocalyptic fiction? 1984 and Brave New World. Um, are out and Fallout New Vegas is in. So a post-apocalyptic I view is different from dystopian. So post-apocalyptic is, you know, something something has destroyed the functional world and you're left with uh, a non-functional world. That's, to me, that's dystopian. Uh, or I'm sorry, that's post-apocalyptic. Dystopian is just a society that is very bad for the people that are in it. Um, I'm not sure why dystopian is out. I don't know how out dystopian actually is, but I know post-apocalyptic has been popular for a long time, um, for a very long time, really. There's lots of post-apocalyptic fiction and movies and things. Um, I think once you have the atom bomb kind of in play, the people are aware that things could actually be, we could actually have a nuclear apocalypse. That inspires a lot more, uh, a lot more thoughts with that. But I don't view post-apocalyptic as necessarily dystopian. Like you could look at Mad Max is obviously not a place you would want to live. It's like out in the desert, post-apocalyptic. But it's not a functional society either, right? So maybe like Immortan Joe in his weird little town out in the desert, maybe that's a, a dystopia or like Barter Town is a dystopia. But it's really part of a broader thing that there's really no functional society anymore for anyone. It's bad for everyone. Yeah, even the people at the top, like Immortan Joe, is still like suffering from radiation sickness. <laughs> he's still not. He's not in a great shape. Bob says, "To what extent did Augustus succeed in creating relative utopia out of the downfall of the Republic and the chaos of the Triumvirs?" 
Um, so there's this thing called the Pax Romana, um, the Peace of Rome. Now, the Peace of Rome was peaceful for the commoners who lived in Rome and the people who lived in the territories under the rule of Rome, but the Pax Romana was not peaceful for the people at the top. Um, Augustus died of natural causes. So we have no reason to believe that he didn't die of natural causes, that he was... But um, of the of the uh, Julio-Claudians, if you include Julius Caesar, I'm trying to think of all of all of them, I think only Augustus and Tiberius died a natural death. Uh, they uh, The rest of them were killed. They were assassinated. So uh, Julius Caesar was assassinated. Augustus lived to a ripe old age and passed the empire on to Tiberius. Tiberius might have been killed by Caligula, so it's possible he didn't die a natural death either. Caligula was killed uh, when he wanted to go to Egypt and live uh, as a living god. Um, and then, let's see who came after. Claudius came after them. I think Claudius, Claudius was he murdered? I don't think he was murdered. Uh, but you had Nero. You had you had um, a large number of them were 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 killed um, instead of dying a natural death. So for people at the top, the people in the the highest political class. The game was afoot. It wasn't peaceful. There was a lot of skin in the game. There was a lot of death. Um, so it certainly wasn't utopia for the people of the Senate and the you know the the ruling classes of Rome, the patricians of Rome. It wasn't really utopia. There was still lots of conflict. Um, so I don't know how, but I think the success for everybody else really just came from the fact that there was one unified governing body that both protected. The outlying territories and collected, you know, a, a reasonable amount of tribute um, from those territories. So you end up having a an imperial society where things were pretty stable. And so stable is as close to utopia as you're usually going to get. But I don't think it was utopia for the people in Rome. There was always unrest with the plebeians wanting more money. You know, circuses and what a grain in circuses. Um, people talk about that. There was there was a lot of chaos in Rome. All the way from the the late Republic, you know, through to the fall of the Western Roman Empire, there was constant, constant conflict. It was never utopia to me. So I don't think Augustus was super successful. I think maybe he himself might have been successful in creating peace for himself. But I I think it was probably probably required um, a lot more upkeep than we than we really realize. Um, all right, let's keep going here. Um, so. Rather than jumping down to the bottom, uh, I'm going to try to go in order as quickly as I can. Star Wars is a dystopia, yes, with the Empire. Um, do you think the sequel trilogy resetting the world building of Star Wars, it really paints the galaxy as being inherently more dystopian? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it does. It also just paints the galaxy as, as just everything is constantly at war and there's never peace. Whereas the, the prequels really showed you that there was an imperfect peace with some minor wars Um small scale wars kind of like what we have now um but it was very different from a large scale civil war um which is what developed in the prequels jack cool i made a sort of dystopia in legoverse there's no draft because the government gives couples production orders for male infants to serve as infantry nice have you seen gattaca yes gattaca is a great example so from from curtis yz um gattaca is a, a movie starring ethan hawk and uma thurman where in the future people are genetically engineered so we've been able to alter genomes and basically everybody who can afford it has their has their offspring genetically fixed so that they're they're better right like the the bad genes which cause heart defects are eliminated from the embryos then they're implanted versus a natural pregnancy where you have sexual intercourse and the woman gets pregnant and the child comes out with whatever unexpected combination of genes uh, and what results from that is an is an overclass of people who are genetically engineered and an underclass of people who are naturally born. And the people who are naturally born can never really work the jobs of the genetically enhanced people because there's an assumption that their genes will not allow them to. So built into the movie Gattaca, you have the conflict between utopia because the society is presented almost as a utopia. It's very peaceful. Um, it's very ordered. But it's a dystopia for Ethan Hawke's character. It's a dystopia for him because he can't do what he wants to do. What he wants to do is he wants to go to space. He wants to be in the space program, wants to be an astronaut. 
and he can't do it because he was born with these inferior genes. And so before he's even allowed to try or show his skills, rather than being judged based on the outcome of his his actions, he's judged based on his genes. There's a pre-assumption uh, of genes. And of course, you know, there's real world things with this with race, right? The idea that somebody from a particular race or particular ethnicity um, is incapable of doing some job because of some arrangement of genes that you believe to be there. Now, in the movie, he uh, he impersonates somebody with better genes. He Basically, they live in his apartment. He uses their urine and blood for all of these DNA tests so that he could pretend to be that person. And one of the most poignant scenes is when his supervisor comes over and he lists some huge number, like 75 million keystrokes without a single mistake. That, was, that wasn't his genes. That was him. And so there's a, a moment there where you realize that it's him. It's him. It's he, him that did all of the correct work. He achieved more than what they thought they would do. And there's another thing where what if somebody exceeds their potential? Well, that just means we weren't, we, we weren't able to assess their potential in the first place. There's other things with this. So if we talk about how this, uh, these ideas can, can iterate in more ways than you realize in our society now. There's this idea that doctors have I, high IQs. Well, doctors have IQ, have high IQs, not because you need to have a high IQ to be a doctor, but because the tests which are required for you to get all the way through into medical school are analogous to IQ tests. They're designed uh, to be very similar to IQ tests. Thus, it's self-referential, right? There's nobody with a, quote, low IQ or a, even, you know, a moderate IQ who goes to medical school and is successful. And if they do, they may still be successful doctors and you would never know. Uh, but because there's this this kind of feedback loop of, okay, well, you know, um, let's say jet pilots. Jet pilots have high IQs because they had to take an IQ test to be a jet pilot. Well, there was no assessment of like, well, jet, jet pilots with high IQs are better jet pilots. That's why we want to test them. It's it's just part of the it's just part of the process. So it's it's a little bit of a of a survivor's what do they call it survivor's bias where you think that a certain populace has an IQ and therefore the high IQ is required to be part of that group when it's just really the fact that you're only looking at the survivors. You've already you've already required a certain IQ or a certain achievement level in order to, to do that job. It's an interesting thing to think about. Um, but, I, you know, you can get pretty deep into talking about whether IQ actually measures intelligence or not, too. Um, Bob says, I was watching your episode on Double Think, New Speak, and Thought Crime today. Are there any more modern examples that you've seen in the past year? I have to think about it. There's always there's always elements of it. So one is a doctored video. Um, so um, there's, a, there's a guy who makes memes on Twitter with Donald Trump and, and stuff like that. And he's made some that are really popular. And uh, the, the mainstream news network starts calling them doctored videos. And the doctored video would have like Joe Biden like appearing behind himself and like rubbing his own shoulders. And that's doctored video. It's clearly a, a humorous joke video. It's not doctored. What they do is they doctor the videos. So they're, they're actually projecting what they do. They doctor videos and edit them in a way that makes you believe something different than what actually happened. A great example was the... Um, the Covington Catholic boys who everybody thought was white supremacists because of a very selective editing job and contextualization of that selective editing job. When in reality, it was the opposite. They did nothing wrong and it was the other people that were being jerks. Um, so there's there's good examples there. Um, the belief that, I, I don't know, I feel like some sometimes people are easily convinced by trolling and I don't quite know how to how that fits into it. So people think this is like a racist symbol or something. When it was just a, a big troll thing, kind of like free bleeding was, if you guys remember that. Free bleeding was a thing that 4chan came up with that, you know, for feminists, a feminist cause would be to not wear menstrual products and to just bleed. And people started doing it, not realizing that it was a big joke and and it was a troll. And so people believed, uh, believed something that was intentionally dishonest. Kind of an interesting, I, I, don't, I don't know what how to classify those things now. Bloodreich says, since socialism was employed by both Hitler and Lenin, 
and therefore Stalin, would you argue the left ends at socialism and after that the spectrum forks into fascism and communism? That's actually, you know, I, I think you could make a great case for that. So um, fascism would be national socialism. So socialism that's um, that's focused on the nation or however you define the nation, whereas communism uh, is really international socialism. It views, you know, like a worldwide revolution. Um, and that was one of the things the Soviet Union really wanted, which is why it tried to spread communist governments worldwide. And there's different, you know, um, Hitler hated communists. Even though they're both socialists, they express pretty different things within that that area, uh, so much so that they would be in radical opposition to each other. That's a that's a that's that's an interesting thought. I'll have to think about it. And if not, why should fascism be considered right-wing? I... And for that reason, I, I don't think fascism really is right wing. I think it's a left wing doctrine. The only thing that's right wing about it is the fact that it's nationalist. Um, but right wing really represents individualism more than collectivism. And nationalism is is something that I I think is just a, a different kind of identity thought. I, I, you know, nationalism is what government you're going to have that that's in charge of your ethnicity, your nation, right? Um, so I don't really think it's, I don't, I don't really think fascism should be considered right wing. I think you end up articulating it as right wing because the people on the left who are in the United States were not fascists, right? All the communists were expelled and ended up in other parts of the West. So they, they view fascism as right wing, even though it's just another, it's just a different version of left wing. Um, it might actually be more center than, than communism was, uh, <laughs> Funny says Hitler was a socialist. Yes, National Socialist German Workers Party. That's the Nazi Party. Um, he was explicitly socialist uh, and anti-capitalist. Ash says, "Do you think Star Wars prequels were more right-wing or left-wing?" I think they're. I don't think they're either one. Um, I don't think they're either right-wing or left-wing. I think they really just view a. Con- you know, first of all, there's a moral conflict. There's soap opera stuff. I think the big conflict is is really between imperfect. Diversity versus power, right? I think it's a more deeper level conflict than right or left wing. I think it's, I think it's the temptations and problems of power versus the imperfection of of diverse power. Fahrenheit four fifty one is an excellent dystopia. I agree. Um, the people actually beg the government to censor on their road to completely losing touch with any value system. Sounds familiar somehow. Yes. Yes, that's a good one. Now, what's interesting is that for the people that are in it, they might view what they're in as a utopia. But for anybody who wants freedom of thought or wants to really understand the world as it is, it's a dystopia. It's not a utopia at all. It's a it's a dystopia. Um, so you there's many things of that. Like people are constantly entertained. They have giant TVs and stuff. Um, you know the whole thing. Let's see here. Have you ever read Dune from Pete? Um, it's an interesting example of the main character trying to turn the planet from a political dystopia into a utopia, but with significant drawbacks as well. Absolutely. Dune is one of my favorite books. I am a fan of the series, but I think the books get remarkably less fun to read after the first one. The first Dune book, which is just Dune, it's an amazing book. It's a must read for anyone who's into science fiction or fantasy. I think it's a must read book. Um, it's a great example of some of the things we talk about, which is, um, you know, the, the Butlerian Jihad really begins to, to, it starts with kind of utopian ideas and it becomes something that's more dystopian, uh, certainly as the books progress. I think it's a little bit outside of, of what we're talking about, though. Uh, it doesn't start, you know, the, the society at large isn't really utopian, um, but it's not really dystopian either. It, it just reflects the imperfect nature of man. Um, and in some cases, it, it's kind of post-apocalyptic because of the, the background of like thinking robots. Do you think it is necessary for all totalitarian governments to be driven by a vision to create a utopian society? No, I don't think that. I don't believe Saddam Hussein had a vision of a utopian society. So I think most totalitarian societies... Um, it's just simple despotism is most of, most of what it is, um, or just a a desire to have control and to make sure things remain stable and controlled. 
um, throughout history. And I think that's most cases. The socialist countries, though, um, they did things that would be considered obscene. They were more able to do them because they viewed um, because they viewed those as being necessary sacrifices to achieve a utopian end. But no, I don't think it's necessary at all for totalitarian governments to be visioned by uh, to be governed by vision at all. I think in most cases it's just will to power. Jared says the big downside to the sequels is no true plan for the new films once they throw out George Lucas's ideas. So then now the galaxy is just continuously in a dystopia. You know, there's no resolution. So if you get rid of the if you get rid of the first order, what's what's going to replace it? Clearly, there's just going to be another order right around the corner. What is a way to write a novel centered around an Islamic dystopia? Um, was a way to criticize and satirize Islam without coming off bigoted, possibly. I don't really know. Um, I actually don't know because I don't live in an Islamic society. I probably couldn't pull that off and I wouldn't have any idea how to pull it off. Um, you could check out the Satanic Verses. You know, I don't know. <laughs> I, have, I have no way, idea how to really answer that in a novel sense. Non-utopian question. Augustus required that actors sit with slaves at the back of circuses what other good lessons can we learn from Augustus? oh man i don't know what uh, what other good lessons can you learn from augustus well augustus was a very practical man i think i don't think he was i don't think he built his world on ideals um i think he was you know the romans were more about what worked and the greeks were more about what their ideals were um so you hear Nassim Taleb often talk about Romans versus Greeks. People who are Romans are people who are like, he, he does what works and that's what he focuses on. And Greeks are people who focus entirely on their ideals and want the world to work the way that they demand that it works and then get kind of upset when it doesn't. You know, the utopianists are more Greeks. Bob says 4chan also came up with the okay sign as a racist joke. Yeah. Uh, they tried to do the same thing by the dab saying it's a type of Zig Heil, but it didn't take off. Yeah, you never know which ones. The, the thing is, people are so gullible nowadays. If you say anything is is white supremacist, people will... Now it's clowns. I think clown is the new one. Um, people will just latch onto it because they're, they're just... They're desperate to believe in some evil white supremacist conspiracy. They're conspiracy theorists. That's why they were doing the Marussia Gate for years now. Um... You just believe in a conspiracy so hard that it must be true. There's a psychic need for that conspiracy to be true. So the okay sign or anything else, it has no meaning, right? It's just a joke, but um, but it ends up having massive psychological effects on people who have a psychic need for there to be an actual an actual conspiracy. Um, Let's see here. Unicorn. Unicorn on the cob. What's funny about countries like Sweden is they went through a massive process of privatizing their formerly government-run institutions. Huge welfare state, but not socialist anymore. Yeah, that's. I think that that's also accurate. I'm not an expert on anything political in Scandinavia. I just know what I've, I've read. Um, and uh, I've made the mistake in the past of calling them socialist and been, you know, being corrected and people explain like, well, really, you know, it's not a socialist society. It's just they have a big welfare state and it's actually not that much bigger than the United States welfare state. You know, we have Medicare. I, I, you know, I was doing my taxes this week and we paid thousands of dollars in Medicare tax. That means we paid for other people's health insurance in addition to our own. Um, we have, we have really big welfare programs in the United States. Just most people aren't quite aware of, of how they end up being expressed because they're not as they're not as clear and easy to understand as like the NHS is in the UK, right? You know, with Medicare and Medicaid, it's like, what are those? If you don't use them, you're just kind of like, wait, they're government health care? It's like, we have government health care? It's like, yeah. And it's actually like most health care is government health care. But yeah, all the all the conflict is over the people who pay for their own health care and their own health insurance and their own health care plans and not the people who kind of have to suffer through Medicare and Medicaid. Um 
Anyway, let's keep going. What's the minstrel art stuff started as a 4chan troll where feminists did? It's called free bleeding. It's not, oh, minstrel art. I don't know about that. But free bleeding was the was the joke um, where they, um, they photoshopped a bunch of blood in to people and then posted it on like Tumblr. And then pe- feminists picked it up and thought it was like a thing. And uh, it, it kind of spread mimetically and people actually did it. Like there was a runner who ran a marathon without any... Um, any sanitary napkins or anything like that and bled all in her pants and thought that was a feminist statement. Again, people can be can be really gullible. I mean, when you when you get into a situation where there's a lot of groupthink, uh, and it, it's not just the left, it's not just feminists. I mean, um, anyone on the right can be subject to this too. You, I see these things mimetically spread, you know, that like, Barack Obama is a secret Muslim or something like that. It, it can it can happen to any any group that points at itself a lot and asks people to spread ideas a lot. Oh, uh, somebody says, talking about doctoring videos, there's AI software that makes live video editing to mimic facial expressions to look real. It links your face to control the live feed of recording. That's interesting. Now, the thing that I had known about was like stuff like deep fakes where people were putting celebrity faces on like pornographic videos and software was able to like wrap whatever celebrity's face onto, onto like a pornographic actress's face. And, um, you know, I th- <laughs> who knows what we're going to have in the future. You won't be able to trust video. There's this idea that you can trust photographs. And I talked about this on Twitter. Um, Lots of photographs have been doctored throughout history, but people believe in photographs so intensely that when they see photographic evidence, they they aren't critical of it. They don't think that think about how it might not represent reality. Um, it it's come to represent a replacement for social proof. Is like photographic evidence or even video evidence, like with the Covington guy, the Covington kids, rather than witness testimony, because a witness contextualizes what they're seeing and witnesses are are imperfect but i think we're going to be approaching a time where the only thing that can be trusted is the social proof the witnesses because everything else can be doctored to create whatever effect you want um, and also contextualized to create whatever effect you want uh blood rock says completely agree with your assessment of fascism thanks for your response you know who actually convinced me on that i think was rocky mr e and i had a conversation with him about it he's like no you know fascism is really left-wing there's has virtually nothing in common with the right wing other than it's pro ethnicity, right? And pro ethnicity is not necessarily right wing at all. That's right wing is really individualist. Um, uh, High reclusiarch Grimaldus, what a great name! Thoughts on Man in the High Castle, either the show or the movie? I haven't seen it. I think I am. I haven't seen it. I, I, if I swatched the movie, I don't remember it enough to talk about it. Um, <laughs> let's see here. Um, let's see here. Dune has a quality fall off. Basically, I've never quite understood uh, why that's the norm for series. Okay, great thing. Little digression from Dystopia Utopia. <laughs> Why is there fall off in quality when it comes to series? Um, there's lots of reasons for this. So the first reason is when you're when you're writing your first book, there's more editing process usually that ends up happening. You're trying to make a tight controlled narrative for that first book. If the first book isn't successful, it's not successful. You really have to make that book successful on its own. And in order to do that, you have to have a complete book. So the first Dune novel is a great example. It's very complete. And then subsequent books get less and less complete with their story and their expressions um, until you end up with like just things being very, very far away from where they started. Um, If you look at something like Wheel of Time, the fall off on quality happens because uh, Robert Jordan lost track of the plot. Like he didn't know... He couldn't figure out how to articulate the actions that needed to happen and spent all of his time on trying to develop character progression. And that just didn't 
didn't matter and it was ended up being boring in the grand scheme of things there's multiple books in the middle of the will of time series that you can just skip there's nothing um nothing relevant to the overall conflict ends up happening um so there's something like that the other thing is that as you progress with the book you know you can't uh you can't recreate the same effect the first one has so if you look at harry potter that first book, the first couple books, have a really heavy dose of escapism. Well, the escapism has to go away as you ramp up the conflict, and you're no longer escaping from normal life to Hogwarts. Hogwarts is a place of danger itself. Um, and so the, the feel of things has to change for the for the conflict to continue. You also don't need to... It's a lot of the, the ways that you present world building attract people to a series, and you don't repeat those as the as the thing goes on you just continue to build characters and events and so the world building which originally sucked people in is missing from later volumes which makes them seem boring by comparison you're not continuing to build in world building stuff now one of one of the great things about wheel of time the first six books each book reveals something big and significant about the world each book is revealing bigger and more important things until you get to book six then after book six Nothing else is revealed about the world. That's part of what gets boring. The world building has already been, all, all the stage has been set up and as the, you know, the audience is ready for things to happen and then they don't happen and that's bad, right? Um, so if you're writing a series, once you set up the pieces, once you build the world, once you establish what has to happen with the conflict, you need to have people act to resolve the conflict. Um, and the longer you prolong that, the worse the middle of the series is going to be or the end of the series. Um, and a lot of cases, authors begin a book without intending to make it a really long series, but the demand continually asks them to make it more series. Uh, and if it's something where you have, it's, I don't know, a recurring character um, who has like 20 books, like, I don't know, James Bond or something like that. Um, of course, that's we're really talking about movies at that point, but it's just what came to mind. Um, I'm sure there's other ones like the Lee Child books or or whatever they are. Um, there's only so much character development you can do without, you know, without making the character become something he's not and, and, and making the readers upset. Um, so it's, you're, you're kind of damned if you continue a series far too long. Uh, and in some cases, if you could tear, continue a series too long, say like with the TV show, how I met your mother, the ending, which you originally devised is hated because you've, changed what that was um there's also if you watch the original death note uh anime or manga or read the manga there's a point where like it was supposed to resolve and there was so much demand for it they just kept writing the story there's there's definitely like a, a part a and a part b and the part b is not nearly as good as the part a was let's keep going dr steve turley expressed fascism communism and globalism as outgrowths of modernity Sort of the idea that you can oppose a one-size-fits-all system on humanity and get a just society. Abs that's a that's a very poignant statement. So modernity, from an artistic perspective, is all about creating new systems. Twelve-tone music, structuralist uh, literature. Um, it's all about creating something new that's designed. It's by design. Um, even things like IQ tests are modern. They're by design. Uh, the idea that you can have a standardized test to determine people's achievement on things is a modern by design kind of thing. Um, so the idea that we can do things by design is is a modernity. Um, and so that's true whether you're going to build socialism. Um, of course, you know, Marxism really starts in the 19th century, but all of his expressions end up happening as part of 20th century modernity. It's a, it's a great thought. And I think it's something to be aware of because the... Top-down organizations don't usually work as well as you would like them to work. And this is true in companies, if you've ever been in, in corporate America. The bigger the company is, the less top-down control you can have and the more autonomy you have to give to like middle management in order to, to maintain efficiency. Um, you just can't design things as well as you would like them to. There's too much uh, randomness and chaos in the world for design to work well. Um, at, at least in a large scale. Like you can design your household. You can design your neighborhood, your town. It starts to get too chaotic for you to have any kind of organization in it. 
uh, at least at anything more than the most basic level. You build roads so people can organize themselves. <laughs> Uh, Ash, if you were in charge of the sequel trilogy, who would be the new evil force? First Order just doesn't cut it. It'd have to be some, I would have some external existential threat. You know, like like the Sith Empire returns out of exile or, or there's just, there's an, an alien invasion uh, and the Sith are the ones who like, there's like a secret order of Sith who called them in. Um, or I'd have just infiltration of the Republic by the Sith and, um, causing causing major events like that because that's going back to the ideas of the prequels um you know the the problems with with bureaucracy uh, augustus also levied a tax on any man who was 38 years old and unmarried being a bachelor after 30 is an absurd luxury isn't it <laughs> i i see i didn't know that i didn't know that um yeah i didn't know that in now in rome though like if you were in your you were in your 30s and unmarried every I mean, people got married a lot and people got married and divorced quite often um but you'd usually want to be married because family was important but also women had a lot of property you could marry you know if you were a patrician and you could you could get married to a vestal virgin after she'd done her like 20 years and she's in her 30s she has like a state pension like you get free money for marrying her <laughs> probably want to marry her Interesting regarding Romans. They were famous for adopting and adapting things from different cultures, from religion to military tech and tactics. Absolutely. That's what I think that's why they were so successful. Is they they harnessed optionality better than anyone else. Scipio was a great general because he knew how to um, harness options. He knew how to set up the battlefield so that he had the most options to succeed and the most upsides with the least downsides. And usually that ended up being cavalry. You know, cavalry became really big. Um, in the late Republic era, because it was, it gives you a, a lot of options. You can move quick, you can run away quickly from a fight you can't win, and you can engage quickly a fight you can win. So cavalry is huge all the way through the Middle Ages, all the way to today. Cavalry is a big, big deal. Now, of course, we have armored cavalry, which is like tanks and APCs and things are considered cavalry, or or um, helicopters is a kind of cavalry that fly in can can uh, deliver payload or deliver troops very quickly or can withdraw them quickly as well evacuate them quickly as well so those options for speed are, are are huge and that's really world war ii in a nutshell too world war one was like setting up these lines and you'd have these slowly moving lines um world war ii is a lot about the blitzkrieg it's like a fast and quick approach where you either succeed or fail very quickly so the, the optionality is really high and both sides adopted that um Bob, I don't want to talk your ear off, but continuing from the reforms of Augustus, he also introduced limitations on divorce, made it more difficult. Why do you focus on family so much? Um, he understood, I, I would imagine, Augustus understood that, now he was married four times himself, but he understood the family, family is the foundation of Roman society and the foundation of any society. And so once you have breakdowns in the family, you have a reduction in the ability of the society to regulate itself. Um, the patriarchal foundations of Rome only work when there's a patriarch. In other words, when men are married and in charge of their household. <laughs> That's the only way you can have patriarchal patriarchs actually control their families. And so I guess a modern equivalent would be we have a high rate of divorce. We have men missing from the home. Um, and as a result... There's a lot more chaos. Boys are not being raised by men. Um, girls are not being raised by their fathers. They're not being controlled. I hate to use the word control, but that's kind of what it is. They're not being restricted and taught in a way that preserves their ability to, to have the highest value and um, to have the best life for themselves. Um, when you hear things like daddy issues, you're expressing that. It's the lack of the patriarch in the family. Um, so there we go. Somebody said that once that like Rome was matriarchal. I they had a high respect for women and women were had rights and were respected. Um, but that it was really patriarchal. Men were the ones in charge of the of the family. Um, Jack Cool man when uh, when people whine at me about how much how much money goes into the military, I cringe because I know how much more gets dumped into healthcare and that has dubious real value. Well, I mean, it's hard to say. Right, like as time goes on, you start to learn that you, there's there's a lot of waste that happens in the military, 
And, you know, one of the reasons I'm deaf in my right ear is because of, of military mismanagement of healthcare. There's a lot of things in the military that they do poorly with money too. Um, you know, I had bad health care, and that's one of the reasons that uh, I was ended up with um, a massive infection in my right ear that made me go deaf. Uh, Ash says, is writing a novel set uh, during the height of the French Revolution, but is told from a point of view of a Catholic priest is a good way to write a historical fiction that's dystopian? It could be. I don't know. I actually don't know, because I don't, I don't know if I know enough about the French Revolution to view it as dystopian. I think the revolutionaries were kind of utopian types and then the revolution itself might have been a dystopian expression until napoleon kind of put things in better order i hate to be pro-napoleon but uh, i think things improved once napoleon took control yeah uh ash why do you think george lucas donated most of the four billion dollars he made from selling star wars to charity because he didn't need five billion dollars and he looked at he didn't want to do star wars anymore and he looked at it as like this is an opportunity to take the value I've created and go do other good things in the world with it. It's his money. He wanted to do something else in the world with the $4 billion. And actually, I can't I can't say that's anything bad about it, right? The fans complain that he sold it to Disney and you have bad Star Wars, but $4 billion can do a lot of good in the world in the right hands. Um, so there's a lot of good that comes out of, you know, the Last Jedi is an expression of all the good that George Lucas is doing with his money, maybe. That's the downside. The downside is bad movies, but the upside is um, a guy who doesn't need money, who's filthy rich, and feels free to spend all of his excess wealth in ways that are going to hopefully improve the world in the ways that he wants. And it may not be successful, but um, you know, it may be really what he wants, so that's good. Um, did you already address how utopia literally means nowhere? I found that to be the most tongue-in-cheek piece of satire from the guy who coined the term. Yeah, Thomas More, um, utopia means uh, without place, I think. Yeah, it means like nowhere. And the, the book's written in Latin. I didn't read it in Latin. So I might have a better perspective if I tried reading it in Latin with my limited Latin knowledge even. But um, yeah, it's it's a little bit of a, of a satire piece. It's it's a playful it's a playful book. Um Utopia, and now if he had spelled it E-U-topia, like you stress, which is positive, then it would be positive. But I think the utopia without it uh, is a kind of a tongue-in-cheek thing. Um, and it is. Utopia is not possible, uh, in my opinion. But depending on who's expressing utopia or dystopia, they're going to view it as something possible or something not possible in their society. In some cases, you see people, uh, Let's let's actually talk about Star Trek. I meant to talk about this at the beginning. So Star Trek is a great example of utopian utopian art. So it's Gene Roddenberry's vision of a utopian future. Now, it's interesting because Star Trek is full of conflicts and action and, and things happen. You know, things are blowing up. All kinds of bad things are happening. Um, but that's because they're out on an exploration mission away from the perfect society. So... Um, the vision of society, of human society in Star Trek is there's no money and there's also no scarcity. And the reason there's no money is because there's no scarcity. And so he kind of went through the, he went through the list here. Like we've achieved their energy is so cheap and plentiful that it's essentially free. And so people are free to do whatever they want in terms of whatever they feel spiritually invested to do. So he viewed it as a perfect society where people do what is spiritually meaningful to them, what is like humanistically meaningful to them rather than what's going to get them money. Um, and, you know, like Star Trek Four, they go back in time and they're like, oh, money, they use money. How weird, right? Um, because nobody uses money. People just have things. But the truth is like you can't really have no scarcity um, because there'd be, there's still things that are of limited quantity that people would want. Uh, and later on in, in later series like Deep Space Nine, they conjured up out of the abyss um, currency that couldn't be replicated because they had replicators. So it was gold pressed latinum, right? Uh, this thing that couldn't be replicated that the, everybody used as, as the last resort of currency uh, because they needed some economic conflict in it. Uh, kind of abandoned this whole no money thing. Um, but Star Trek's a great example of that. And then likewise, each show 
expresses this conflict that we're talking about in a lot of, uh, not, I shouldn't say each show, lots of shows do. So there's a great one from either the first or second season of Star Trek The Next Generation. They go to this planet that's a utopia. And in this utopian planet, everybody's young, healthy. They are free with their sexuality. They freely have sex. They're beautiful to look upon. Um, now, uh, <laughs> the the jokester me is going to remark that everybody's white in it, <laughs> right? And that's just kind of a product of when it was made. Uh, I think not really like them being explicitly racist, but um, everybody's young and beautiful. Their society is perfect and well-ordered. People run to get places and they get natural exercise. It's a utopia. But Wesley Crusher is playing football with the kids or playing a, a ball game with the kids and he falls into the flower bed and crushes a plant. And the consequence for that, because he broke the law, is death. And so we have revealed the terrible, terrible downside of this utopia, kind of like Logan's Run where... Everybody has free access to sex and a life of endless pleasure, but they die at 30. Uh, in this case, it is um, you die anytime you violate any law, big or small. And so the conflict becomes, well, in our society, we don't, our punishments fit the crime. We think it's unjust and evil to kill people for all crimes unless, you know, and, and actually in, in their future society, you would never execute someone for a crime because that would that would be a fundamental violation of their rights. Um, but, you know, there's this God that that's on top of the planet, this super alien that prevents the enterprise from interfering with this utopian society. And so the conflict has to be, has to be, can you convince the God, which has created the perfect society that he is wrong about this utopia? Uh, because for Wesley Crusher, it's a dystopia. He's the one who has to suffer death for falling into a flower bed. This is a great episode. There's many episodes of Star Trek that are like that, that either show a, a utopia or a dystopia. Now, in literature, you usually have um, two different resolutions. So a utopia um, <clears throat> is usually presented as utopia on the surface, but actually dystopia. And you destroy the utopia to restore normalcy, which is an imperfect but better world for everyone preserves human rights and things like that there's higher things that are more important or you have a dystopia that has to be destroyed in order to re to restore normalcy you almost never have the normalcy or a dystopia that has to be wiped away to create utopia you're almost never in literature replacing a dystopia with a utopia it's very interesting that i've i can't think of a single example where that actually happens something like the matrix you have um you know this levels of utopia and dystopia but the goal is to make people free and see the world as it is uh not to make it perfect and then by the time you get to the third one you realize that each you know there is no no one really escaped the matrix the matrix which is the city you know the the inner matrix is where people are most content in an imperfect world and for people who reject that then you have the outer matrix which is really a lot more hellish but it's necessary for them to be contentment. They need a higher level of conflict. Uh, so it's interesting. The, the machines or whoever's running the matrix has created two imperfect uh, systems that are in a way their own utopia. They're not utopia, they're, they're imperfect uh, because people cannot stand perfection. They can't stand utopia. Uh, it's like we made it perfect, but you guys didn't rejected it. You didn't believe it was true. Uh, so the reason utopia doesn't happen is because there's a recognition that utopia only happens if we're perfect and we're not perfect. Jared says, for the sequels, it would have been better if we saw the heroes 30 years later with a rebuilt republic and we see them uh, with a new threat rise up to take over the galaxy. I like that. Rather than seeing the galaxy being already taken over by a new threat. We don't even know if the first, we don't know how much power the new order or the, the first order actually has. Are they splinter grouped? Are they have they taken over the galaxy? The resistance represents the republic. Is that the main government or is that some tiny government now? What what's the status of the galaxy? Um, let's see here, unicorn on the cob. Is it just me or did Tolkien never have a problem with quality drop off? I feel like everything in Middle Earth is wonderful. Well, he didn't. Uh, yeah, he didn't have a quality drop off. He was a big procrastinator, um, and so that means anytime he did something, it was really worth doing. Uh, he also didn't write as many. Lord of the Rings was constructed as one book. 
The Hobbit was constructed as one book. The Silmarillion was constructed as one book. And not a ser long series where you have an, un an unending plot arc or an unending set of character arcs. Um, you know, they're, they're more isolated ideas. And even the, the edited books that have come out, like um, Children of Hurin, which I do like, um, those are self-contained stories. And they're very good for what they are. And each book is also really different. The Hobbit is really different from Lord of the Rings. Silmarillion is very different. Children of Hurin is very different. His short works, like, um, you know, all the fairy tales he did, those are very different from each other. So each time he created something creatively, he approached it in a creative way and did something new and different with it. And so it feels fresh. You know, you can go and read Farmer Giles a Ham, and it feels feels so different from everything he did but it's fresh and original and new and wonderful you know or reverandum or, or any of the the shorter works he did um george barrett of dune why would you theorize that herbert used the ancient spartan ruling epithet um a triday e dystopia for the hero line weren't they sometimes up against unsurmountable odds i don't know i i, I can't theorize like on the fly with that i, I don't remember enough it's been you know, I read all the Dune books in high school, and that now is like 20 years ago. And I haven't read anything except the first book since, so I don't really know. Uh, Jared says, I don't know, I'm just trying to make sense of what the sequels could have been. Yeah, they could have been better. Obviously, they could have been better. I don't spend a lot of time thinking about it. I'd rather focus on my own stuff at this point. Um, let's see, let me go back up. I missed a bunch of stuff. Um Push back on standardized testing as modern invention. Medieval China introduced standard imperial tests to become uh, an imperial clerk. Now, that's a great point. Plagued by cheating, though. So uh, I'm trying to remember what they called that society. Um, there's a there's a word out there for it. Um, was it? I'm trying to remember what dynasty. If it was Song Dynasty or something. Um, there's a word for that. They tried to run the society, like to run it by the most intellectual people. And it had problems too right um so that's a great point i did i wasn't really thinking of that but but yeah uh, and maybe maybe there's some repetition of those ideas as we see them and probably you know there's nothing new under the sun so if if europe hadn't thought of it then probably maybe china had thought of it at one point right uh that's a great great point i, w I really wasn't thinking about that at all i know i'll think of the word after the stream's done for that uh, that type of organization um for the external Star Wars threat, that's what the Extended Universe did with... Oh, yeah, the Yuuzhan Vong, an invasion from another galaxy. I forgot about that. That's a great point. George uh, Egerog, how can a fan budding author avoid making your work too derivative of what you're a fan of? Um, I wouldn't actually avoid it, you know? I would write exactly what you're passionate about writing. It'll come across. Try to Try to start with one new idea or one new thing. Um, and if you have one new thing and everything else is stuff people have seen before, it'll, it can totally be successful. Um, it's more about same but different than it is about being totally original. So I would just do the stuff that you like and try to do one thing that's new. Like my stuff is not completely original, right? Like there's like standard European, Norse European races, elves and stuff. Uh, Crown of Sight, this is my new book. You can get this right now. It's 99 cents for the ebook. Um, there's very little humans in this. It's really just elves and this other race called the Drysenith. So the Drysenith is an original one, but what's original in my books is the philosophy that's in them. So I started with a, a way of constructing the world that was inherently um, weird and is exposed through the story that essentially the world is created by people um, in, a non, in, in a way that involves God, but it's not quite obvious. So it's somewhat somewhat gnostic but it's actually really not but kind of influenced by that um so i i don't i don't bother reinventing the wheel i only reinvent the wheel on the stuff that i think should be new and different um having one original thing is good um hi reclusiarch says uh oh congratulations on your second child first stream i've been able to catch for a couple months and i'm glad i could you thank you for joining me and thank you for the congratulations my my girl's doing okay. Um, I'm a little tired. She wasn't feeling good last night. So I was up all night, but that happens with the little ones. Um, eventually they sleep pretty good um, on their own. 
Off topic, but what do you think of David Lynch's Dune? I like it a lot. Considering the studio interference to make it a two-hour film, Lynch made a very creative and unique film that was quite faithful. I like the director's cut. It's weird because the director's cut is directed by Alan Smithy, and Lynch considered it one of his biggest failures. But then the theatrical cut is directed by David Lynch. So I'm not sure which cut he actually claims. Uh, but I like the the director's cut. I think it's great. I think visually it's beautiful. It has a great mood. The, the actors are beautiful to look at and uh, do a great job with most everything um I, I think it's a i think it's a great film i really really love it and um it's probably i think it's a great representation of dune uh, i that comes from a person who likes dune uh, and likes the book and knows the book but i can imagine if somebody has never never read the books they might be puzzled by some things in the movie especially the two-hour film um but I, I really like the director's cut uh jack cool says family stupendously important so many people just don't get it anymore it is it's the it's a big priority when you have a family like you stop stressing things taking time away right like i was up all night with with my daughter and my wife was up with me what was a chance for me to spend time with my wife without my son going pay attention to me Here's this toy. Play, play with me. Um, and so that, you know, if you have an abundance mindset, then that's everything's positive. Even things that are struggles can be good. Um, and when you have a, a family priority, it's like, yeah, I didn't get to write. You know, I haven't written anything. I Actually, I outlined a new book, and I'm going to be putting, putting the early versions of it for free up on Subscribestar. It's called uh, Flat Earth. <laughs> and it's about how the flat earth conspiracy is a conspiracy that's the that's the starting point that's the concept flat earth conspiracy is a government conspiracy it's created by the government and i i start from there and i go to some weird places with it and i think you guys will find it very entertaining it's very different from the other books that i've done it's not fantasy it's more weird thriller i guess um so it should be cool um but yeah when you when you have the family it just changes everything and i'm actually more productive having a family than not because it changed the way I understand priorities so that I know how to prioritize work and pleasure and family and things like that. Um, Chapter Master Dante, $5. I really appreciate it. I want to read your work, but I don't have much time to read. Have you thought about creating audiobooks? Also, kudos on the birth of your daughter. Absolutely. So, excuse me for a second. Audiobooks will happen, hopefully this year. Um, I understand better how to actually make myself come out with one. <laughs> The problem with audiobooks, I'll just talk shop for a minute. Audiobooks are a big investment, and it, if you are paying somebody else to read the book, they're a huge upfront investment that may take you a long time to pay down. So if you're already very successful as an author, audiobooks are great. I'm not very successful. I'm like, you know, I might be like top 10%, but I don't make a lot of money selling books. I really don't. Um, in fact, it's hard for me to track how much money I make selling books. I would realize this actually doing my taxes, like trying to figure out like, okay, I have lots of people that I gave books to that gave me money in other ways, like by watching videos or giving me super chats. You know, how do I, how do I relate that? How do I, mon how do I figure out the monetization, monetary value of the books? And it's hard because it's like a total, total product kind of thing. But with audiobooks, uh, People will constantly say, hey, it's the only part, you know, audiobooks are still a growing market. That doesn't mean you're going to make a lot of money on it. If you already have a book that's successful and you can market it, then yeah, dude, audiobooks are great um, and you can make your money back. Uh, I, I plan to read my own audiobooks, partly because I enjoy doing new weird things, but also because I'm cheap. And so if I record my own audiobook, and let's say it's a 15-hour investment of work, to record an audiobook, uh, or actually probably be closer to 20 uh, with all the editing and stuff. Let's say it's a 20 hour investment. 20 hours, it's valuable to me, um, but I can pay myself nothing for 20 hours. And then whatever I make, it's just, it's, it's just money, right? So 20 hours, minimum wage, 10 bucks, 200 bucks. So if I make 200 bucks on the audiobook, I'm doing okay. You know, that's easy. 200 bucks is not that hard to make on an audiobook, especially within a year. Um, 
So I will do them this year. I'm finally getting enough business and traction to where I feel like I could sell audiobooks. And I'll probably have a few for free on the channel as well. I, I'm kind of thinking like my books that are free, um, I might just do free audiobooks of them. Uh, just because you don't have a lot of time, Crown of Sight is a, is a two-hour read. So as much time to watch a movie, you can read Crown of Sight. That's how I designed it. And uh, I, I think it's a great two-hour read, actually. I really... Um, I think it, it does a great job entertaining someone for two hours and they'll feel like watching a movie, uh, only reading a book. It's very action-packed and the philosophy is pretty tight in it as well. So I do appreciate the um, the super chat. If you if you want a book, send me an email and um, and I, I'll send you I'll send you a copy because you give me five bucks. So if there's one that you want, I'll give you I can give you a gratis copy. Not a big deal. And that's the thing. If I think about it as a total. You know, the, the business is one big thing. Giving away free copies is not that big of a deal. If you if all you do is sell books, it's like each time you give away a free copy, you're like, but this person have bought the book. I'm losing money. It's like, I don't, that doesn't matter, right? What matters is just that the, the business in total is growing. More people are reading it. More people are downloading it. More people are watching. More people are participating. More people are sending me emails. <laughs> all that stuff's growing and I know I'm doing okay. And I've seen my income go up as a result too. Um, Blood Reich, somewhat off topic, do you think the honor of war has largely died out because of war becoming more unfair? I.e. not man versus man, but bomb versus man. Dodging invisible bullets seems unfair. I would have to think about that. That's very that's a, a kind of a profound statement when you stop and think about it. Right. I don't think the honor of war has died out, though. I think I think the honor of war is is dying or has died. But we still have a strong, at least in the United States, we still have a strong um, love and almost a cult-like appreciation of soldiers. Um, routinely, if somebody's in uniform in a restaurant around here, someone will come and say, like, thank you for your service. And um, that's interesting because there's people who would say, I oppose the war you're fighting, but I'll still thank you for my service because this belief that... Um, that there's that there's like a I don't know how to put it like there's a spiritual um, spiritual calling almost to war here in the United States. It's it's hard to communicate when you're inside of it. Somebody who's outside a little bit more could probably understand the the war cult a little bit better. Now I I don't want to insult anyone by calling it a war cult, but that's kind of what it is. It's a little bit of a worship of the people who are involved in war, even if you don't approve of the war. So you you have somewhat of a moral conflict is where you like the people who are engaging in the war but you don't like the people who are calling the shots and you don't like the fact that you're at war at all. It's weird. I don't I don't know how to square that circle. Um What are your thoughts on uh, a dystopian setting on the verge of collapsing and potentially giving way to a new renaissance? I think that's great. Um I think that that's that could be very rich if you want to write a story in that. You know, a, a dystopian society that things are falling apart, the government's like losing control. That could be super interesting. Um, yeah, I think that would, I think there's a lot of, and you can make great characters within that that are are idealistic and oh man, there's there's a lot of growth that could that could happen in that. To make up for non-utopian questions, does dystopia require modernism? I find it hard to think of a medieval dystopian setting that isn't anachronistic. Boy, that is a hard one to answer. Ah, that's a hard one. Um, I think you can, but I think it. I think you're you're probably right that it's going to be somewhat anachronistic. You have to be selective about what what you have, right? Like. Um, if you're going to have a dystopian view of like ancient Egypt, right? So like the Exodus story is somewhat dystopian, right? Like the, the Hebrews are enslaved. Um, is that it's going to be somewhat anachronistic because you really need to, you really need to identify with the people who are impressed, who are oppressed when, you know, the, the lives of Hebrews as workers may not have been as bad as it's usually portrayed in movies and art. Um, it still was obviously worse than what their alternative was, which was to leave Egypt and pursue their own, um, their own aims. Um, so it's, it's interesting to think about. I don't know. 
So I think like it's easier to think of dystopia as a future setting rather than as a past setting. Because in the past, we understand everything about how that dystopia, if it existed, ended. Um, you could think of dystopia existing as like maybe a certain point in history. Like if it's medieval dystopia, maybe there's like an evil king, but it is, it's going to be somewhat anachronistic. Um, that's a good point. So I don't know. I, maybe you just don't worry about it. You just do it anyway. Maybe the meme version of the Spanish Inquisition that didn't really exist. Yeah, we imagine there are imaginations of the Spanish Inquisition. Or our like imaginations of, you know, our positive imaginations of the, the honorable Knights Templar and things like that uh, on the flip side. Marco Vargas says something. So this is kind of going to be relevant to this book I'm writing. You need conspiracy theory to provide the police with stuff to investigate the action of groups that act historically. Ostracizing writers of conspiracy th theory is called the silent spiral. So the idea of the book is that conspiracy theories and flat earth is one of them. This is just like the precipitating one. Um, uh, they're perpetuated by some parts of the government to identify people. So when people attach themselves to the conspiracy theories, they get identified by certain traits uh, that the government is interested in. And that's kind of the setup of the book. And the protagonist is a guy who works for the, um, um, the NSA as a data miner, kind of like what Edward Snowden um, kind of revealed. It's like he organizes algorithms and bots that that organize people and data and track people to identify terrorists. And then he gets hired to essentially identify conspiracy theorists. And he doesn't quite know what is going on. And so as he gets deeper and deeper into it, it becomes much, much stranger and more dystopian. Um, there's a much weirder um, and much stranger set of, of things at play. And he begins to lose sight of what reality is, which uh, does he, he starts to, question his own version of reality and wonder if if certain conspiracy theories are correct because they're being used to identify people um it's an interest it's gonna be an interesting story well i missed a bunch of stuff hold on i'm always uh, i'm always behind on the chat so i always appreciate the the patience with it um Why doesn't J.J. Abrams or Ryan Johnson care about the world building of Star Wars? Don't they realize terrible world building would destroy the cohesiveness of their trilogy? They don't realize it because they've never done it. All right. J.J. Abrams hasn't world built anything really significant that I can think of. He's just kind of worked within settings that are easy to, to just work in. Um, same thing with Ryan Johnson. Uh, the world building he did maybe with like Looper just wasn't very cohesive. I don't know. I don't think that I don't think it's on their minds. I don't think they're fantasy sci-fi writers, so they don't think about it. And they probably didn't consult with anyone. They probably just thought that they were Star Wars fans and could just go for it. Of course, I think Ryan Johnson wasn't. I always thought Yuzan Vong would have been the good choice for this the Star Wars sequel trilogy antagonist. Yeah. Or Thrawn. The Thrawn trilogy would have been a good set of stories, maybe. Um, wouldn't Imperial Chinese testing be an attempt at brute forcing a true meritocracy? No, um, I, I'm going to say no because it's you're right. It's an attempt to brute force true meritocracy, but true meritocracy only emerges. Well, first of all, it can never emerge because there's too many other things at play that wouldn't be considered meritocracy, but people would would prefer over meritocracy. So people prefer nepotism over meritocracy in most cases if you dig down deep into it. They prefer to take care of their family over strangers who are more meritorious than their family. So if people give jobs to their brother-in-law, it's because they care about their family, not they care about their family more than they care about the difference between their brother-in-law's performance and the ideal meritocratic person. So there's some some things with meritocracy. I've explained this in a couple videos that I think people got very upset with because I'm like, there is no that meritocracy is somewhat mythological. Um, like we believe that meritocracy is good, but if we actually, I mean, this could be a, a utopian dystopian thing right here. You know, people believe meritocracy is good. Like Ayn Rand believed in like this true meritocracy, but if you actually were to present people with a meritocratic world, they might actually really hate it, uh, because they are incapable of 
they'd be prevented from doing the things which really matter to them, like caring for their family, right? So family is a higher level priority for most people than money, status, lots of things. Like family's big. So if I want to hire my brother-in-law, you know, let's say I want to work with um, with another writer. My brother-in-law is a writer. And it's like, you know, I get hired. It's like, okay, I, I, we're going to pay you $100,000 to write a script. Who are you going to work with? It's like, boy, I could work with anyone for that. It's like, but I probably work with my brother-in-law because I trust him and I want him to be successful too because his success will make my family successful and it kind of it kind of goes back in on itself. It's not merit, it's not very meritorious, but it benefits me more. Um, so if it was a true meritocracy, it's like you must you must work with the best writer, and then I have to work with somebody I don't like. The end product may end up being bad as well. So when you try to brute force the meritocracy, that can happen as well. The thing is about determining who's the best at something. You have to kind of remove the stops and let people try stuff. Like who's the best trader on Wall Street? It's whoever ends up with the most money, right? It's it's really a pure meritocracy in that sense when it comes to trading. Um, but if you were to try to test people to decide if they should go into the trading market and not just let people try it, you would be preventing the meritocracy by enforcing a test, right? That's I guess that's the point I'm getting at. So when you put a, put a barrier like a test, which is designed to enforce meritocracy, you can actually be preventing those natural mechanisms from working and, and letting the, the most meritorious, the best people at their job actually get a shot at it. You know, maybe somebody has massive anxiety and they do really bad on standardized tests, but they're, they would be a great practitioner of medicine if they got to the clinical stage. If they were an apprentice, like they'd be an amazing doctor. Who knows, right? I could think of a million different alternatives. Ash says, do you think Star Wars prequels will be even more appreciated in 20 to 30 years? Absolutely, I do think they will be. I think they'll be continue to be more appreciated as time goes on, as they have been now. Because when they were released, the backlash against them from some of the fans was, really came down to expectations, and they were very different. You know, really, it's it's good to think of the prequels as something quite different from the original trilogy. They were very different, and so... Um, uh, T oh yeah, George Lucas's THX 1138 is a dystopian film. Great one. I, I really like it. He actually made, yeah, I think he made, there's another one he made at USC. I don't remember if it was like the same, an earlier version of the same one. I'll have, I'll have to check and, and maybe do a video or something about it. Make the audiobooks. I will. I'll get to it. Maybe, you know, maybe I'll do that before. I want to get to work on this next book, <clears throat> but maybe I'll try to take a week and record an audiobook. Because I have a break right now. I have a baby. Maybe I'll just take a week and do an audiobook. Which audiobook would you guys want to see? Maybe I'll send out an email. Tell me which one. Um, probably like Water of Awakening is my best selling book. That's the one that continues to perform the best. So it'd be either this one or Muramasa would be a great one to start with. Or I could do a short one like Crown of Sight. And I could put this one out for free on YouTube, right? Or on SoundCloud. You could have a two hour free audiobook for you guys, or you can buy it on, on Audible with a credit and give me money. But um, So this one might be a good one to start with. There is an audiobook actually of Garamesh and the Farmer that you can get, and it's free on YouTube uh, which, with me reading it. Um, so you can get that one for free. <laughs> Pete, apologies to go back to Dune again, but have you ever heard about um, Jodorowsky's Dune, the famous Dune film that was never made? I've heard about it, but I I don't know much about it. Uh, Owen Benjamin was saying today that he thought Flat Earth was a PSYOP conspiracy, i.e. that the whole concept was a front committed by somebody. I think that that is a, uh, it's interesting that he thinks that maybe we're thinking on the same lines. I th although I think he thinks the moon landing was a fake. I don't think it was. Like my grandpa made the computers in the lunar module. He like wired them. <laughs> so I don't think he did that for no reason, but uh, um we can talk about that in some other video. I, I think a PSYOP conspiracy, it's more likely, I feel like it's more likely than just people randomly attaching themselves to flat earth, like mimetically. But I don't know. I mean, like, I don't know which one. It seems at least, it seems like, at least it's, I, I don't know if it's more likely. But it's certainly a possibility that's far north of like 5% to me. <laughs> that it's a That it's a conspiracy committed by somebody. Um, Flat Earth Conspiracy book sounds really interesting. I'm really excited to write it because it's very different. 
<laughs> Bob says, I plan to record my audiobook because I'm cheap. You just like doing voices. If you would like me to do a large variety of accents, you should let me know because I will try them. <laughs> why are so many feminists, supposed feminists enamored with Raylo, Kylo and Ray being a couple? Yeah, I don't know why um, Ray would be into somebody who murdered her friend and his father right in front of her face. But I, I mean, if they got them together, it would just, it would be, it would be great because it would just be the complete destruction of all sense in story writing, right? Why are feminists enamored with it? I have no idea. I can't get into a headspace where that makes sense. I think because they long for love on some level. <laughs> and so they, that's the only male and female, they want, they want Poe to be gay. So that means Ray has to get with someone Kylo is the only one because they already got an Asian girlfriend for, um, for Finn. <laughs> Jared says, I think people enjoy the prequels more as time goes on there. There's a lot to them. They're very well produced at the very least. Um, Jack Cole says, I think the whole world war one killed the honor of war is an interwar pacifist narrative. Effective tactical counters to bombs were fielded by the Germans as early as 16 with, uh, Sturm Truppen. I don't. Th I didn't say that World War One killed the honor of war. Um, I don't. I think that is kind of an interwar pacifist narrative. There, there was that generation, the generation after World War One or the generation that fought World War One, seemed very disaffected by the what happened with the the modern thing. But of course, World War Two was really a continuation of World War One. Um, I don't know. It's hard to say. You might have a better, better line of reasoning on it than me. Um, let's see here. Sorry, the the chat always jumps down, and I'm always really far behind, so I apologize. Um, next month, the Phantom Menace will turn twenty. Yeah, that's a that's a good one. Um, Rashi420, I have trouble with character growth uh, in my work. Currently working on comedy, I find in many comedies the growth feels artificial, shoehorned and cheesy. Totally, man. It's hard. It's hard to write. It's hard to write uh, natural growth. But I, I think that the best growth, uh, the most effective growth happens like as a shock. So something bad happens because of a flaw of the character. And then as a reaction to that, they have a like a dark night of the soul and they correct something about their behavior or character to grow. Um, rather than having it be natural. Um, and in a comedy, I think that tends to work pretty well. Just have a big thing that happens and it doesn't feel quite as cheesy to me. Um, but that's a hard one. It's really hard to write characters uh, and have them be really believable, funny, and have them have growth. It was a, When I was writing comedy with, with Matt, um, we wrote a couple comedy screenplays. It was really hard to think about how our characters were going to grow because you you conceive of someone as like being a total like simp and you want them to grow you know you want them to grow into something better um but it's hard to do that without it being just like them waking up one day and deciding to be better you know uh, i remember when you were taught in school that plagiarism is wrong jj must have ditched that class that day <laughs> yeah oh man it's depressing that you can earn billions of dollars off of blatant plagiarism and the drooling pleb celebrated as breaking new ground oh my gosh uh, perspective what's dystopia for the hebrews might have been utopia for the egyptians absolutely it might not have been utopia for the egyptians either though i could write that too it's like maybe the hebrews were you know low-cost labor and so lots of egyptians were missing out on meaningful work or something i don't know actually i think the hebrews were mostly uh, you know i I think historically they liked them around in Goshen because they were herders and that was like not a, they had kind of like a, you know, the upper Egyptian classes had a thing against keeping animals other than cats, maybe. <laughs> Historical dystopia probably requires delving into their mindset. Not a modern fearing a religious takeover, but you're religious and you're afraid of your irreligious ruler and his policies. That might be cool. You know, I think you could write a historical dystopia in late medieval Italy with the city states. I think that would actually be very interesting because you have those conflicts. Um, the, around the time that The Prince was written by Machiavelli, there's so much interesting politics in medieval Italy. It's it's just such a rich field. 
there's so much rich history to read. They, if you're going to pick one, one landmass to read the history of, it's Italy. <clears throat> you will never be bored. Um, Bob says, trying to think of some examples to inspire fantasy dystopia. Emperor Julian the Apostate. Yes, probably seemed dystopic to Christians immediately after Constantine. Absolutely. Julian the Apostate is super interesting. Uh, because he tried to go back and be pagan, though, all the pagans knew that he was kind of a fakie, too, because the, the, the pagan tradition was more natural. And so he was approaching paganism like a Christian. <laughs> uh, and so it was artificial in that sense, too. Um, Similarly, Emperor Theodosius probably seemed dystopic to pagans immediately after the death of Julian. Both of them tried to destroy the opposing religions. Yeah, uh, I think so. Uh, but I think Julian, I, I seem to remember some, maybe it was Cassius. No, Cassius Dio. I'm getting my dates mixed up. I'll talk about it some other time. I don't want to, I don't want to strain to what I don't know. The key to answering shortly is to, or the key to short answers to answer shortly. Don't strain to things you don't know. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know quite. I seem to remember reading some stuff that, you know, Julian as a pagan was not really expressing the pagan religion correctly. Jar Jar and Rian don't world build because the first is a parasite and the latter is satanic. <laughs> Rian. Rian is how, that's how we're going to say his name from now on. Is making a universe based on Aristotle's defunct views on physics a good way to world build? I don't really think so. I mean, you can, you can do like Discworld or something. I don't know. You could do a flat earth version. Um, I don't know if, if, if you could follow it through and be consistent, maybe, but it mostly, I think it's easier just to have people have things operate the way people are used to. <clears throat> Julian, the apostate probably verges on the apocalyptic despite his bookish nature because he attempted to rebuild the Temple of Solomon and defeat Christianity by elevating Judaism. Interesting. I don't remember that story, but I'll have to I'll have to read more about it. It's been a long time. Uh, Jack Cole says, Neil, I should be my pick, but water has a, has the hot chick on the cover, so I understand if you choose that. I'll probably do Water of Awakening first and then Neil Ash because they're going to be part of a series. You know, it's a series. What's your opinion on the Giver dystopia? I haven't read it since I was a kid. I don't remember it. I don't remember well enough to, to comment. Sorry. Bob says, do a large amount of accents. Um, unicorn on the cob. The girls feminists are into Ray and Kyla because they got tired of Twilight. Yeah, they're into abusive relationships. Twilight's all about abuse. Owen makes some disturbing points for moon landing being fake. Can't go back. Blew up the tele uh, <laughs> telemetry data. Scientists contradict each other in interviews and on it goes. It's all weird. They do. Um, so... There's, there's some, I'll leave it for some other video to like talk about. Some other people have done some very good debunking the debunkers on the videos that the videos had to have been shot on the moon or like the, the things that would explain them not being shot on the moon actually didn't, don't work um, because of the way gravity works. There's a part where like you drop a hammer, it couldn't have been slowed down because the, the motions would have been very strange um, to film it at speed. There's a lot of things that, that go into that. Um, so the telemetry data was recorded on like paper, I think. It's bizarre. Or like on, on old magnetic tapes. <clears throat> Computers were so huge. The big reason that I think we can't go back, so this is a weird, uh, weird thing, not to get too deep into this, but the moon landing wasn't purely a government project. Um, the Howard Hughes company designed and built the lunar module. Um, Texas Instruments, which my grandfather worked for as an electrical engineer, this is before the days of computer engineers, um, designed computers for it. So um, the Saturn V rocket, you know, everything was basically taken from the private economy and the military industrial complex and assembled into what would be able to get people to the moon. So first to go back to the moon, we'd have to build more Saturn V rockets and we don't have the tools to build them. In order for you to build the Saturn V rocket, you have to build the tools to make them as part of manufacturing really big things. So you'd have to kind of start from scratch and it would actually take a long time to rebuild the rocketry facilities, like the, 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 the ways to build that stuff. You'd have to rebuild essentially the factories that make the stuff. You'd have to retool them at the cost of billions of dollars. So 
and NASA is really bad at doing what it, it's done. As as the as NASA is more government, it's worse and worse at space. So um, this originally all the everyone from NASA was recruited out of the private economy. As time goes on, they're recruited directly out of universities, and the quality of what they do goes down to the point where all those space administrations outside of the U.S. are the ones that really lead the charge, and you have to you have to go into space on European on uh, European rockets and things like that because they haven't had that same kind of degradation. Oddly, um, Russia somehow managed to keep it together, I, I guess because they never had um, the private economy to begin with. It's hard I, I, It's hard to explain how like Russia was successful um, being communistic uh, other than I, I don't know. I, you get scientists to do what you want them to do. They can figure it out. And also I think that they were maybe less less concerned with, uh, they, they were more willing to take some risks. I wonder what the effect the Great Depression had on the view of World War One and war in general. I don't know. My grandfather was born and grew through the, he grew up in the Great Depression and fought in World War II. He's not anti-war. There's a, there's a myth that World War II ended the Great Depression, but really you didn't get out of the Depression until after World War II the change in economic policies, rolling back in the New Deal. Would you like to see a fictional conflict between a dystopian state and a utopian state? The dystopian state would win. <laughs> I would. That would be cool. The original Shoah. Ancient Hebrews were forced to help Egyptians do their taxes. Oh, dude. Yuck, 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 yuck. <laughs> uh, I got it. Dystopic Italy. Bonfire of the Vanities, one of the most famous historical book art burnings from zealous followers of Friar uh, Savonar uh, Savonarola took over Florence. Oh, man, I have to read about that again. Yeah, there's so much. Uh, so each of the city-states had its own thing. There was republics that um, were unable to defend themselves when there was invasion by the king of France. Char I think Charles V was involved in Italy at one point in the medieval period or when, you know, during, during the 1400s, maybe. I mean, it's really, there's so much interesting history. I need to go back and reread like history of the Florentines. Um, so much good stuff there. I, I like world building based on uh, what if something in history changed. I like that too. It's always a great place to start. Uh, usually though, I don't like time travel though. Um, I, I've expressed my dislike with someone goes back in time and delivers the Confederacy, all the AK-47s in the world. <laughs> uh, I don't like that. NASA literally says the reason they haven't gone back to the moon is they lost the technology. I have a video of it. Yeah, like the, the technology, well, I could explain that how they lost, they never had some of the technology, right? They never had the technology for the lunar module. It was made by a private company. They never had it. Um, Julian wrote a series of essays attempting to prove why Christianity was a false religion. And one of his arguments was that it was a Jewish heresy. Um, I mean, we, we presumably we would be able to go back to the moon just to, I don't like to spend forever on the moon. Presumably we'd be able to go back to the moon if there was a political will to do it. Um, I also, I seem to remember Bill Nye years ago talking about how bad NASA was. And I think he's done like a complete 180 on that. He's like, NASA's stupid. They don't, you know, they can't do anything right. They're, they don't do anything important anymore. Um, all that kind of stuff. All right, I'm starting to get towards the two hour mark. So let me read the last of these comments and then I'll I'll sign off. I need to help my wife with some stuff. Um, Nick, uh, Nitaku says, one of mine is what if between the two world wars was real superhumans started appearing? That sounds fun. And who's going to win the war? You know? The proud German Superman or the the American Superman? Unicorn on the cob. A massive amount of astronauts and NASA personnel were our Freemasons. Tons of pics of it online. Look into it, bro. Yeah. Um, I think my grandpa's a Freemason. He might be a Freemason. For, so there was a lot of people involved in Masonic lodges in the past that we don't seem to see as many anymore. And I don't know if it's gone more underground or just like, lodges have changed what they do i'm not so sure on it but uh, secret societies are prohibited by my religion i'm a mennonite never secret societies you don't you don't do secret societies it's just an opportunity to engage in um, satanic thought 
Anything that is the truth, you should bring it out to the world and show them. Uh, you shouldn't hide it in a room. That's that's where people do evil. You do evil behind closed doors and you do good in the light of day. Um, Hyra Klusiarch says, do you think that because of the lack of originality of TFA, it incentivized RJ to make TLJ as awful as possible? Maybe that way TLJ was a middle finger for the success of TFA. I think um, I think The Last Jedi was just a hate letter to fans. Like I think it was just Ryan Johnson thinks Star Wars is stupid and just wanted to make yeah, he just he wanted to make a bad Star Wars film. I am not, not bad, but wanted to make a film that that defied all the fans' expectations. It was a middle finger to, to what fans wanted, and of course they didn't like it. You know, most of them didn't, I guess. Jack Cole says, "On all conspiracy theories, I'm going to just go on not trusting the government and wanting to raise a family." Yeah. So, so here's the thing about conspiracy theories. Like, here's a here's something to just like a little I don't know what to call it, like a heuristic. Does it affect you? is the first question. And if it doesn't affect you, you don't you don't need to concern yourself a whole lot with it, right? Like one conspiracy theory I think is very possible is that Osama bin Laden was not killed by the US. We never saw his body. Everybody who was involved with the mission mysteriously died in a helicopter crash like a month later. Like there's it's so weird that I think it's pretty possible that he he died at some other point. Like apparently he needed kidney dialysis. So he might've died at some other point and then they just killed somebody and then just said it was him, right? Well, that's possible. Um, but does that really affect me? I don't know how much it affects me. Um, I don't think it does. After watching Bill Nye's Netflix sh uh, series, I think Bill Nye is kind of a schmuck. Yeah, Bill, Bill Nye is a guy who doesn't know what he doesn't know. He's a great IYI, intellectual yet idiot. Um, he thinks he knows things he doesn't know. But he's it's, his range of knowledge is narrow, uh, and he thinks that he can extrapolate that to other things. Um, there's lots of people who do it. He he's arrogant about it. Lots of people make this mistake. Can make these mistakes, including me. You know, you you have an understanding of of one subject, and you kind of start pushing towards the edges or things that you know less about. Um, and you can be you can be saying you can be you can be treading outside your expertise and, and talking about things which are nonsense. You can see that the astronauts are on wires when they're in zero G in their space stations. I don't know about that. I haven't seen any wires. <laughs> um, I mean, you can you can look at that. I think uh, people. I think. Bill, Bill Nye sold his soul. He looks totally hollow and says nonsense. He looks like defeated. Yeah. He looks like he's controlled. Like like he just doesn't... Like he's fed up with the world. He looks really weird. He looks like defeated. Bob, um, the book Bowling Alone points out that many fraternal organizations have downsized as American society has grown more alienated. Yeah, that's that's the point I'm, I guess I'm getting to. Maybe that's a good book to look at, Bowling Alone. Um, so yeah, these these fraternal organizations I think have, have kind of shrunk. People have become maybe too individualistic. Like, I think you need a, a balance between individualism and collectivism, actually. I mean, like the family's collective. I think you need ties with other people i think that's healthy for people you just don't want those to 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 override any kind of individual rights uh, and that's that's where things become that's where the collective becomes dangerous is when it stops being voluntary and starts overriding rights like we have a we have a right to your land because the collective says we should have the land rather than you know um you let people who are related to you use your land or you you know you give people a deal because they're part of your tribe you know it's different a different approach um jack cool says i'll be at fort jackson this time next week i'll try to catch the show on my phone but after that it'll be peace out for months good luck I, I, you're going to ocs i think or or something like that um so that's good i'm sure you'll be successful remember that it's a process right the process of officers candidate school like any other um limited time program or boot camp program in the military is to make you into what you're going to be um, and that's something that's a an idea my dad kind of pounded into me years ago. It's like he's like boot camp. It's like people portray in movies boot camp is bad. It's like boot camp turns you into a really good soldier, and then each training you do turns you into a better soldier. 
it's like you focus on it being hard or people having a hard time, but that's that's just part of the process to make you better, you know. <laughs> The book's title, Bowling Alone, comes from the fact that bowling leagues, once a major part of male American society, have almost entirely disappeared. That is very interesting. You know, maybe uh, the replacement is gaming guilds. Maybe we should start like a gaming guild. You know, I was I was part of a multi-gaming guild that just collapsed a couple of years ago. Maybe I'll start a new one. And we'll think of a cool name, like, I don't know what. We'll call, do it something in Latin. Disciples of Scipio or something. Um, and then uh, <clears throat> then you have a gaming guild. It's a fraternal organization. And what's kind of cool is like I don't have to say no girls allowed because it's if it's gaming or like make a war gaming guild or something, uh, war gaming group, it's gonna it's just going to be dudes. Like dudes are what's into that, you know? <laughs> it just ends up being dominated by males anyway. Um, if you let people choose their own things, you'll find that knitting circles are just entirely women. And uh, hunting parties are entirely male. It's just people sort themselves in, in interesting ways when you just let them. Um, I tend towards distrusting the experts and whatnot. Like they will say emphatically that mountain lions only exist in the West and Everglades, but I've seen them here in South Carolina. Yeah, they also say mountain lions are endangered here in California. There's like mountain lions like by my neighborhood. You know, they're everywhere. And you're not allowed to shoot them, even though they'll eat your sheep and stuff. So there's a whole, you know, it's almost a joke here about farmers like secretly killing mountain lions, uh, kind of further up in the hills than where I'm at. But um, yeah, there's tons of mountain lions. There's so many mountain lions, they are a pest. But the people who count the mountain lions either don't know how to count them or don't count them as high as they are because it makes sure that they have a job counting mountain lions. That's like my conspiracy on that. <laughs> People are going to, if people have a job to do, they're going to, their first goal is to make sure they always have that job to do. So if your job is to count endangered mountain lions, you're always going to want them to be endangered. You're never going to want to get an accurate count of them. You're never going to interview farmers and be like, so how many mountain lions have you shot while eating your sheep? And they're like, I've shot 10. That's like, oh, there must be a lot of mountain lions here. It's like, you're not going to do that. You're going to, you're going to go to an area and you're going to be like, okay, well, we saw a mountain lion. So there's one here. And then you're going to move on uh, so that you can keep having a job dealing with endangered species, right? Like It's really hard for endangered species to go off the endangered list, even when there's like the kit fox. And when I lived in Bakersfield, there was kit foxes all over the Seven Oaks golf golf course, which is kind of by my house when they built it. Because um, I lived like at the edge of town and then they built the golf course. Um, they, were, they were everywhere. You'd see them everywhere just eating just like growing, breeding like rabbits. And it's like, this is an endangered species. Like, don't tell them that or they won't be able to maintain the golf course. They're like, this is a protected area for the kit foxes. It's like the kit foxes are thriving there because we built the golf course. But there's also just a lot of kit foxes. They're just a little bit reclusive, you know. I tend to distrust uh, a lot of experts with, with that kind of stuff. It depends who's paying them, you know. I trust farmers because farmers like live it and they'll just be honest. Pipeline is basic training, then off to officer school. Cool. Nine weeks, then 12 weeks with three days off in between. Awesome. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that'll be a, you know, it's it's a process. What's a multi-gaming guild? Multi-gaming guild is just, it's a, it's a guild that doesn't just play one game. So, you know, you might have a guild that just plays World of Warcraft. Have a guild that's like, we have a presence in WoW retail and well, classic. You just recruit a lot of people to build teams to go into different games. When a new game would come out, you figure out who's going to play it and you go do that game to try to always have people to, to play a game with. It's something that's kind of fallen away. I'm not really sure why. I think it was a kind of a product of late 90s, early 2000s internet culture and gaming culture, and it's just kind of gone by the wayside. Um, Nitaku says, I'll, I'll eventually be able to catch more than the tail end of your stream. I hope. I appreciate you coming by. <laughs> I really do. Um, ultimum spy, uh, spes, last hope is my Latin phrase of choice lately. Ultimum spes, last hope. You know, I like the Marine Corps. Semper Fidelis, always faithful. The game guild should definitely be the mongooses. The coolest mascot is obviously the cobra, but mongooses kill cobras. Therefore... Mongooses are the coolest monster. The fighting mongooses. 
Natanai, good guild name. Even toddlers voluntarily segregate, segregate by gender and often by race. Oddly enough, my son, uh, he, he'll go to the girl group and I want them to like play monsters with him. He's like, I think he just likes the way girls look. <laughs> George Barrett, Nicole Perlman, um, GOTG met Neil Armstrong. Both Wedden and Gunn claimed the idea of Thanos as the MCU villain. When Nicole introduced him to her in 11 uh, draft, who do you believe? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I think maybe social media has a hand in killing fraternal orgs too. Social media has also began to slowly impact the younger generation of churchgoers, myself included. Kind of sucks. Yeah, people, so social media makes it easy to believe that you're engaging in social interaction because it's easier than calling someone, going and like having dinner with them or having them over at your house. It's easier to click like or comment on a, on a, on a photo. So people tend to just do whatever's easiest to get the feeling of, of social interaction, but it ends up being hollow and, and people are, feel lonely. And they also get addicted to Facebook and social media because they need that little social high because they don't have it really in their lives. You know, I didn't want to get into Facebook for a long time and I only got onto it reluctantly. Um, same thing with like MySpace. Mountain lions are here in Iowa. A few years back, there was one around a public park and animal control had to relocate it somewhere outside the city. Yep. I've all but lost my desire to go to a normal Sunday service despite still rig rigorously believing and holding the teachings of Christianity. Yeah, that was a problem with me. Uh, and I mean, it, it still is a problem because of how weird I am. It's hard to find fellowship in other Christians, modern American Christians. Uh, you know, maybe I, I'm going to, maybe I'll be Orthodox. I'm going to go to an Orthodox church, have them try to convince me <laughs> that they're right, you know. Um, but you notice um, a lot of Orthodox, Greek Orthodox or Eastern Orthodox Christians don't really have that feeling. It's what I always notice. They're, they're really tight in their church. Catholics, less so, but still pretty tight. But um, all the Protestant churches are kind of loose. Not a lot of fellowship. People are weird. People come and go. People church shop. It's kind of weird. I, I don't... I, I have to do some processing and thinking about it to really figure out where I'm going to go religiously. But I'm, I'm still Christian. I consider myself a Christian. Um, but we haven't found like a permanent home, especially since we moved. There is like an Anglican church around the corner. It's Christian Reform, which is, we're Dutch, so that would probably fit us pretty good. But, you know. What cued you into what social media does to you, Jack Cool says. I noticed it doing it to me. So I'm a very introverted person. You guys may not realize this. You guys do the personality tests like I'm an INTJ assertive. These are the rarest personality type apparently. And I think it was, I don't remember whose personality type I shared it with. Um, so I'm always self, I'm always questioning myself and what affects me. Um, and I'm always asking if I, how do I feel and why do I feel that way? And so what I realized was that I was, and I still kind of do it with Twitter because like all my, all my like social media friends that I like to talk to are on Twitter now. So if you don't follow me on Twitter at David B. Stewart, follow me on Twitter and I'll, if, if you interact with me, I'll assume that you're a real person and I'll follow you back. <laughs> um, and, uh, anyway, uh, you know, I'll look at Twitter a lot say like, what's going on? What I want to, what I want to say in Twitter, you know? Um, but I used to do that with Facebook and I'd be like checking it. Oh, someone, and they used to send like notifications on your phone. Someone liked your photo. You're like, oh, cool. Yeah. I'm glad she likes my photo. It's like, I was, I was stopping him. I'm like, that's not real. That's stupid. And I'm, I'm stopping what I'm doing to look at my phone and hope that I get a good feeling from it. Whoa, this is really controlling. So this is what inspired a story that, Hopefully, I'll be coming out with, with Jesse White, who I've had on the show a couple weeks ago before my daughter was born, um, called uh, Socknet, which is about mind control through social media and integration of technology. So people are completely controlled through their social media interactions, and they don't realize it. It's a dystopian. That's a dystopian. Um, 
Ash says, why do so many critics praise The Last Jedi? They don't care about writing 101. I don't know why. Maybe maybe they liked... Sometimes people like things for small parts of a movie, and sometimes people dislike things for small parts of a movie. So I do that system where I use numbers and rate things so that I have a view of the movie in total and everything it did good and everything it did bad. But sometimes people are like, I like the movie, you know, the movie is awful because of this thing. And it's like, what about the rest of it? For some people, they get dominated by the feeling of one moment. So there might've been a moment that they really liked in Last Jedi. And there were a couple like very big Star Warsy kind of moments where you're like, this is going to be a Star Wars moment. And then it just like, it's executed correctly, but it's wrong, you know? And those moments are completely detached from, from like maybe they liked the bomber part and that made them feel good. And so they liked the movie. A lot of people don't, don't think objectively. I don't think perfectly objectively either, of course, but I, I try to extract myself from it a little bit. Becoming something really funky in particular, like uh, set of anchorist. I don't know what that is. And the Orthodox groups are fairly cultural ethnic, aren't they? So, <laughs> Some of them are. Eastern Orthodox in the United States, not so much. It's a it's a worldwide church. So you have Greek. It can be very Greek, depending if you have a Greek population. Like there's a lot of Greeks around here and a lot of Armenians. So they're big in Armenian churches and Eastern Orthodox stuff, right? So if you go to a Greek Orthodox or Eastern Orthodox church here, there's a lot of Greeks and Armenians. If you were to go to an Eastern Orthodox church in the Midwest, there'd be a bunch of Russians because it spread into Russia. So it kind of depends. Like the ethnicities, I think certain ethnicities hold on to their religious ties better than the wasps do, the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, or just Northern Europeans in general. Um, so you notice Italians remain Catholic. Um, Spaniards remain Catholic. Hispanics remain Catholic. Actually, that's not entirely true. A lot of Mexican immigrants around here are Jehovah's Witness for some reason. Um, they come in not very religious though, but a lot of ethnicities maintain their religious. So it's easy to see like, oh, you know, um, Catholicism is like really Hispanic around here. It's like, well, they just have maintained their Catholic, you know, Catholic roots. If you were to go somewhere else, it might be not nearly as, as ethnic. Um, it just depends where you're at. Right. Um, but uh, the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church, no church is going to turn you away due to your ethnic heritage unless it's a church, and like unless you're doing Shintoism, right? So if you're if you're Shinto, that uh, that's explicitly Japanese and only in Japan. Like there's no Shinto church outside of Japan. But most Christian things are not that way and Buddhism is not that way. And most religions are not, are not ethnic per se. It's just ethnic ties preserve their religious ties as well, I think. At least that's what I see. So many people I follow seem to talk about the Orthodox. I've always wanted to clean house rather than scurry to someone else's. You know, I mean, uh, that's uh, that's a good point. I don't know how to clean the Protestant house, though. It's too many houses. Um, and some of them have been really converged. You know, if, if you go to a, a lot of Protestant churches now, you go to them and they're just preaching against doctrine. 2,000 years of established doctrine, whether it's Protestant or not, you know. Unicorn says, I've been looking at the Orthodox thing. It's weird. I can't get past the icon thing. So you don't like iconography. So icons, um, the way I've had it explained, icons are not idolatrous. Uh, you know, it's just religious artwork. Um, you're not worshiping the object. So therefore, it's not idolatrous is what they would say. Um, but Protestant perspectives tend to view, you know, saints is idolatrous and marionology as explicitly idolatrous i don't have a great conclusion on it yet the cuckteans are darn near inescapable bro also if you're looking for a dutch enclave look up associate reform presbyterian it's a dutch thing here in the south um that's what i think the the church around the the corner from me actually is um since we're dutch you know kind of works There was actually like a, a Mennonite Holocaust in the Ukraine a long time ago, too. A lot of people don't know about that. Anabaptist Holocaust. Um, 
If you don't need a church to be Christian, you can always practice and study the Bible on your own. Yeah, you can, but you want to have fellowship with other Christians. That's a, that's a big part of the epistles uh, because you need to be corrected and you need to be available to correct other people and support other people in their in what they're doing, right? So if you see somebody that's going awry, you go to them in private and you go with two or three to try to correct them. You can't go to them in private and go to them with two or three if you don't ever see them, if they're off on their own. Um, so it, it really shouldn't be an alone thing. That That's pretty clear to me from the epistles and the early saints. But it's hard. You know, it's hard to find actual acceptance and it's hard to find actual fellowship. Yeah, especially because I'm such a weird guy, it's really hard for me to have fellowship with anyone. Like I I can get along with anyone, I can talk with anyone, but to have somebody like feel like they actually accept what a weird guy I am, it's kind of hard. Most people I'm too cerebral or I'm into weird music, you know. Uh set of uh, Set of vacantism is extra conservative Catholic. They don't recognize the last few popes as legitimate ever since the liberal reforms of Vatican II. Hence the name, the seat is vacant. Oh, that's really interesting. I'm going to look that up. Thank you. I I actually think Pope Francis is like a satanic anti-pope. Get into my weird views. I, I just, like he does everything in, in the opposite of what seems to be established. Um, not just like, He's very pro-socialist, but uh, every time I think he says something, it's just like, am I really seeing this from the Pope of the Catholic Church? John Paul II also kissed the Quran at one point, which, you know, I if you're a practicing Muslim, that's that's on you know that's you, but I would not expect a Muslim imam to kiss some Catholic relic as if it represents a holy relic to his faith. It's that was a very weird thing to see. Um, the seat being the throne of St. Peter. Yeah. Funny thing, like, you know, Satanists use St. Peter's cross. It's kind of an odd thing. You know, they all have the inverted cross. They're like, yeah, I'm like Satan. And it's like, that's St. Peter's cross because he was crucified upside down. So it's a symbol of a saint. You know, it's a traditional Christian symbol. Um, Nitaku says here, Catholics, mostly German and Irish. There you go. Yeah. I'm also happy I'm not a freak about church things. Several of my friends have just become numb to our local church. They can't quite grasp or express why. They're all Christian. I think there's some kind of, there's something going on at a at a level that I, there's too many points of, too many points of data, too many people for me to articulate it. But I feel like something's shifted from the Protestant um, Jesus movement stuff that was popular in my youth to something else. I think uh, a lot of young people I meet are, going to the most traditional churches because they need that feeling that there's orthodoxy and that things are secure and things have been decided, things have been debated. Like the idea that you could go to a Catholic church and the ideas of St. Thomas Aquinas have been iterated and debated for 700 years before they're like, this is official practice. That's something that you can kind of lean on as you study. Whereas if you go to, uh, you know, a uh, an evangelical free church. What exactly do you feel secure about with their beliefs? It's whatever the head pastor decided in seminary was like the proper way of doing doctrine. And he might've done like historical seminary stuff, which, you know, he didn't decide on any kind of ironclad orthodoxy. It's hard to know. And you know, if I go to somebody else's church or we've gone to a couple churches here, sometimes things are weird. And this is what happened at, at my church growing up. They hired a head pastor. He wasn't a Mennonite. I don't know why, but he was all, he was crazy. Like he was all over the place and he destroyed the church from within. It was like, it was almost satanic. Now that I think about it, um, it was very weird. And, um, it definitely kept me away from church for several years because of how bad the atmosphere was and all the people there. Um, high reclusing says what's Protestant. Anyone that followed Martin Luther out of the Catholic Church and stopped being part of Catholic uh, communion. Um, so that would be Anglican, Dutch Reform, Swiss Reform, French Reform, like all the different forms of reform. They're not, they're not uh, Catholic. Um, Mennonite, Anabaptist, Amish. 
uh, Baptist. There's a million of them. You know, anything that's not Catholic or Orthodox is Protestant, but it's Christian. But it doesn't it doesn't have a specific meaning. Uh, maybe that's the point you're trying to get at. There's not a great specific meaning, even here in the United States. I mean, especially here in the United States, there's no specific meaning to Protestant. You just kind of mean not. And I've been to I've been to Protestant churches where they're like Catholics aren't Christian. I'm like, you're nuts. You're nuts if you think that. Catholic just means universal. It's an umbrella term. Yeah. My first girlfriend was from one of those hermit Christian families. They totally went off the rails with what they thought. Fellowship's important. Yeah. You don't want to be uh, isolated or alone with your thoughts. And um, that's why I really value like YouTube conversations, like the comment section uh, on my YouTube channel, because it subjects me to a lot of things I don't know about, or just, it's good to have people who aren't you know, people telling you things that you, they believe that aren't what you believe. Um, I think he, the just read the Bible alone thing is real, but it's best thought of as a life preserver or lifeboat. Yeah, totally. I mean, at the very least, like you should be, you know, you can, you can watch, a, you can watch sermons online or, or study online with other people. I don't know. Um, you can't replace real fellowship though. Uh, Mother Brain says, I'm from a Catholic family. Trust me. Uh, we think the current Pope is a clown too. Most Catholics, I watch a lot of Catholic YouTube. It's a weird thing you may not know about me. There's a lot of like Catholic stuff I really like to watch. Um, Milo's most recent book, Diabolical. I'd recommend it if you're Catholic or you just are interested in the what's called the Lavender Mafia and the major scandals that are actually happening in the Catholic Church that the media is not talking about. It's big stuff. Like systematic abuse of people in seminary that are trying to be priests it's insane um it's insane some of the the problems that are happening in the in the roman catholic church um i saw a video of one of the popes bowing to lord rothschild i swear to god i haven't seen that but i mean if you saw it it exists i mean if it exists it exists uh, i understand what you mean about uh francis and the points you're making are easily what the um I'm going to have to learn to say this word. Uh, set of Acantists, I would say. I usually hear it. Se de, uh, se, uh, se de vacantis. Vacantism. <laughs> set of vacantism. I'll, I'll try to learn that. Um, but yeah, Vatican II is also worth looking at. If you're not Catholic and you just want to know some weird things. See, I studied medieval liturgy as a graduate student um, and specifically the music. Um, so I really have an attachment to the mass as it was, I guess. A aesthetics matter. I'm surprised you never heard of the set of whatever. It's a Catholic out of the matrix pal told me them. Well, now I know about them. And so I can learn about them. I can learn about them. Um, most people who claim to be satanic are just atheists that are wanting to upset people. Absolutely. Um, only the really weirdos that are into like the Luciferian, actual Luciferian stuff, they end up, they're, they're way out of it. You never see them. Yeah, there's, uh, and the other thing is like, oh, you know, black metal's full of Satanists. It's like none of them were Satanists. It was all just part of the act. Jack Cool. Something in general is what you can you can look up Barg's video on it. Something in general is way wrong with modernity. It's gonna be exciting for us military age single dudes. You guys with family stay behind us 100 miles back. Yeah. I don't know how to respond to that. Blood Reich, I also can't get behind the ecumenical movement. Too much bad doctrine for me. I'm always preaching believers should cling to the text, not try to force their views on it to feel good. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, I need to I need to finish up here, guys. It's been too long. Um, let me read the last couple comments and then I'll get out of here. Protestant News. The United Methodist Church of the USA held a vote on accepting homosexuality. Despite pushes from the leadership, the congregations voted against exception. Yeah. What you are doing now is uh, connecting to all those people that feel like you do, even though uh, you find it hard to connect. You definitely are connecting to those um, who watch you and feel that way too. 
So thank you. Yeah, well, thank you. I appreciate that. I, and you know, it is a it's it is a connection. Um, it's why I try to like let as many people do the comments as possible. I only really like ban people or delete comments if if they're prohibiting people from from speaking or they're they're like spam advertisements or sometimes people spam the same comment over and over again or just it's really bad attention seeking behavior that's going to distract people i could talk more about it in some other video i i said that's like you ban people it's like you have to like if someone's bell ringing someone's ringing a bell in your face you can't you can't speak um so you have to you have to kind of cut down on some of the chat a little bit Luckily, the, the live stream chat's pretty good because I don't have a million people showing up to it yet. Um, if I was to create an anti-mage, a user is sort of magic that acts like an anti-matter with matter, should I basically treat the character's power like I would a regular wizard? I think so, yeah. That's kind of cool. Yes, uh, Reclusiarch says, thank you. Uh, that's my problem with the faith. It's not Christianity, it's modern Christianity that bugs me. I do too. You know, I come in, I go into a church. Um, allow me to wax poetic before I before I get out of here. Um Jack Cool says, recommend a Grim, the, the theologian you mentioned before, whose name escapes me. Uh, he needs 100 level Christian information. So, um, the let me let me uh, what's his name? Ryan Reeves, I think is his name. He does historical theology. It's a very great channel. It's one of the uh, one of the few YouTube channels that it's like everyone should watch this because it's so informative, and it's he's so uh, objective about the way he approaches it. And he can really look from each perspective of each sect he talks about. Um, the uh, the Catholic channel I like to watch is Dr. Taylor Marshall's channel. <laughs> I really like him. He's a good guy. Um, yeah, so let me wax poetic before I go on, on modern Christianity. Now that we've gone away to... Uh, um, away from this dystopian thing. The dystopia of... The dystopia of modern Christianity to me is uh, you go into a church and it doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel real. I go in and I don't feel, you know, I don't feel the presence of God. And I don't feel, I don't feel a reverence or a fear of him. So I, I go into a building and it looks like a modern building. You know, it's, uh, it looks like the world outside. So I haven't crossed a threshold into something that is distinct from the world. And as being raised as a Mennonite, that's that's an idea that has an effect on me. But when I walk into, say, like a, an Orthodox church, I feel like I've passed the threshold. So I walk into a modern Protestant church. It feels like the world outside. I go and I sit down and I have worship music played at me, which is um, some permutation of popular music. Uh, the popular music, which I have no real love of uh, being a metalhead and a baroque head i'm attracted to things which are um, just different they're they're off the beaten path uh, but i go in and, and the music is it's like an imitation of that satanic world outside um and it's like i'm trying to think of a tolkien quote it's like the bring of horns Loud and vain and endlessly repeated. We used to call them seven eleven choruses. Seven words repeated eleven times, and that's what's there. People there with guitars. It's there to be just like the world outside, um, as if you're trying to make the church a part of the world, and you're make, trying to make it so indistinct from the world that people will just be attracted to it because it's just another part of their normal world. And that's not, to me, that's not the message of Christ. And I'm speaking as a Christian here. To me, the message of Christ is salvation from a fallen world, not a nicer version of the fallen world, right? Um, there is no utopia, right? Even when Europe was completely, quote, completely Christian, it wasn't. You know, people, the, the reason that Thomas Aquinas had to spend time creating proofs for the existence of God is because there were people who didn't believe even though everyone else around them did or didn't believe in Europe back then. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's been a constant thing. So when I walk across that threshold, I feel, I feel a vacuum. It feels vacuous and empty. And like, there's not a, there's not a meaning. Like people really want there to be a meaning, but it just isn't. And they've been told there that 
other, you know, like that Catholics are crazy. <laughs> like I mentioned, they think that they're not Christian or something. Uh, and people don't really cling. They don't really cling to the doctrine. It's more about acceptance of people. But a big part of Christianity is rejection of sin. So in order to accept people, you have to preach to them that they must reform their ways and reject sin. And so a person who doesn't reject sin is not a person that you can really be in fellowship with. That's a person who doesn't, doesn't believe or they would, they would reform their ways. So this is some of the feelings that I get. You know, I just get the feeling that I'm, I'm, not, I'm crossing into something that is almost sinister in its, in its chameleon-like imitation of popular culture. Um, even the idea that people would wear nice clothes on Sunday is missing. You know, to where if you wear nice clothes, you look weird. You're the weird one, you know. And it's it, I saw this transition in more tra- you know the more traditional churches I grew up in to being just kind of this weird um, pop Christianity, I guess. Anyway, that's those are my thoughts on it. Um. <laughs> I want something more profound than the mundane. Yeah. There's something beyond, you know, there, there has to be, aesthetics matter. Aesthetics represent what you believe. And so when you walk into a place and it's intended to reflect the beauty of God, that has an impact on you. Um, and it has an impact on me. All right, so that's it for today. Uh, Thank you so much for watching and chatting with me. Um, And I will see you guys next time. Uh, I do appreciate the super chats, as I always do. You can buy my books on Amazon, Crown of Sight. This is a two-hour read. It's a good one, 99 cents. Um, This book, you will actually get the ebook for free if you're on my mailing list. Um, If you haven't gotten it, I can give you a copy. If you're joining my mailing list, this one will come out to you sometime in the future. And you can get a free copy of that. And if you did read Crown of Sight, please do re- re- leave a review on Amazon.com. It really helps me out. Um, hopefully you enjoyed that story, and I will have some audiobooks hopefully coming in the next few months. Uh, I might take, might forego doing some writing and just spend a, a week trying to get an audiobook out. So um, anyway, thanks, guys, and I will see you guys next time.